to continue to uh, explore uh, some of the questions that you have put together and to deepen the understanding of uh, what's going on uh, as who we are. Because a lot of people have a, a misinterpretation of who we truly are uh, because a lot of it is based on you know what they hear so forth what religion dictates but also you know how we've been programming conditioned and learned and so forth and exposed to the human experience and thinking that the human experience is is all there is and that the human experience is actually operating in a way where that's what is and there's nothing outside of that and also people believe that uh, somehow we're put here and really didn't have a choice and we have to kind of try to make it through whatever's going on and good luck with it and whatever happens, <laughs> happens sort of thing. So there's a lot of different interpretations on how uh, things actually function. And once we get an understanding of how it actually function, uh, it, it's actually, a more of empowering state for us mm -hmm. gives us an opportunity yeah. to be able to really uh, get into the driver's seat of navigating through our life and we see a grander purpose of what is taking place because I mean a lot of people talk about purpose a lot of people talk about you know why we're here or there's a karmic this or a karmic that or something of that nature um, and that's heavily misunderstood too and it a lot of times it puts a lot of burden and so forth which is fine as part of an experience but it gets to a point where we really want to um, understand really what's going on and really connect with our journey and uh, what we uh, are choosing to do in this journey. Because each journey is not, you know, uh, the same as anything else. I mean, we may have create some uh, replication here and there, but in essence, uh, each journey is another adventure. It's another opportunity to you know, see how far we can go and expand and become you know, a grander aspect of self. So anyways, uh, with this exploration, we're going to play with some more of the questions and, and, uh, and address certain uh, thing. And it's great that I'm communicating with you uh, in a way because you, uh, you know, I share what I share, but at the same time, it's great to, to get your uh, viewpoint but also the inquisitive part because you represent uh, you know a collective of people that are you know moving forward and and trying to kind of what people call awaken or have a better understanding or a deeper understanding because you know many people are starting to feel that there's more to life than this human experience yes and the other part is is this what we're here for you know and the other part of it is also looking at life and seeing it as the place of suffering and whatever else right so um and we're going to shed a lot of that and and help us to understand a little more of really how things actually work so yeah thank you for um uh, interviewing me and giving me the opportunity to share things and also to be participant in in you know uh, the representation of the collective and their questions and and wanting to understand things deeper so we'll play with that and and I'd love you know the input that you put in and the analogies you use so it's all part and parcel absolute perfection thank you I'm humbled and I'm ha I'm honored to uh, interview you and uh, and get come tips and glimpses into your wisdom, and um, I I uh, I find myself kind of wondering whether what is the let's say um, added value I this this issue this this uh, introspection into the let's say higher higher realms of existence. Do they bring to to the listener to the viewers? For myself, I can say that uh, internalizing uh, the reality of the soul uh, release uh, the the biggest fear of all, the fear of death. Mm. That's one thing. The other thing is it brings me. It's it allows me, kind of say, empowers me to be less judgmental in times and to be more accepting 
But with that, I see the, the drama, the human drama that we play all together. Okay. And uh, even though that I understand, I recognize the dramas, I fell into it time and time again. <laughs> but that's life. <laughs> that's the essence of it. And uh, this, this intriguing, let's say, philosophy, philo philosopher um, conversation, what does it bring value? Is it bringing any value to the viewers beside of me? That's the question. Well, absolutely. I mean, your questions are, are not coming from, you know, just your inquisitive mind. Uh, your questions are also questions that others are asking. And then what we share and what we look at um, broadens the perspective and also gives the opportunity for people to kind of answer their own uh, questions that they've had themselves. Because, you know, one of the things I found, and I've been doing mm -hmm. this for a long time and over 30 years, uh, I found that the answers that people or the questions people ask and the answers that are given does address many, many people's inquiry. And a lot of times people can't even vocalize the question or really want, they want to understand, but they don't even know how to even question it or even look at how mm -hmm. can I actually get this answer or whatever or understanding and so forth so when two people that are dealing back and forth like yourself the questions you're asking is answering a lot of questions uh, a lot of questions that people already have and they haven't asked because even with retreats and so forth i find you know the numbers are usually pretty big in the room plus of course we live stream and mm -hmm. um, i hear it all the time afterwards i get a lot of comments afterwards it's like wow i'm glad that they asked that question because it was something I've kind of wanted to know, but I didn't really get a good picture of it. And I didn't even know how to ask and who to ask or anything like that. So yeah, this is, this is a useful, this conversation is useful beyond you yourself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm relieved. And uh, so, so the, the, the outcome from the previous uh, interview was me delving into the, um, the metaphor of, of a structured uh, organ, let's say a, a cell in a tissue, in an organ, in a body, in society, in the planet, in a, in a solar system, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And, and it is hier hierarchical, and in each level there is hierarchy and there is order. And the way we see it, uh, it is, there is some kind of governing system or governing co consciousness. Right. And the way I, uh, I learned uh, higher spirituality, which is not religion, is that spirituality or the way to measure spirituality, whether it is uh, positive or negative, is whether it is directed or controlling or hierarchical. And if it is hierarchical, that means it's not very evolved. It still contain, contains some truth, but it's not very evolved. So my question is regarding this, um, where is the hierarchy and who is beyond the hierarchy in the soul's realm or soul's dom domain? Is it kind of like us? There is, there is a, a secret society that controls us? In the, in, in the soul's domains. And after that, there is another level of soul's domains that control and so forth and so forth. That's my question. Well, that's a deep one. Um, the, like even with uh, chaos and so forth within even the cell structures of the physicality, it's still well organized and it all works in harmony. Um, so as, as for the souls, I mean, when you really look at the basic fundamentals, what a soul is, it's actually uh, a pocket of consciousness that has a, a singular focal point to come in and have a series of experiences which are either on this realm or other realms or other playgrounds and, and taking on one form versus another form mm -hmm. and so forth. Now, 
each soul it has the, co the full collective consciousness of its essence. However, because it has been directed into a focal point so that it can go out and have a singular focal point and then discover its expansiveness uh, to it, uh, each, each soul actually uh, will, will be able to kind of direct what it chooses to do. But there mm -hmm. are levels of over souls that basically oversee it's mm -hmm. like the body right it has the cells but there is a, a an overlaying consciousness that oversees what the cells do now the cells have its own memory the cells have its own consciousness the cells have its own capacity um, even for example when you take the analogy of the brain you know people used to believe that the brain instructs every cell in your body how to function mm -hmm. yeah when of course they discover that that's not true that each cell has its own memory each cell has its own consciousness each cell has knows what it needs to do and the mind itself may just give a random uh direction but like if you want to move your arm the belief was that the brain is sending out all these little singles to control every single muscle and every movement and so forth when when in realization, even when the brain is damaged, for example, and it can't do that, it still has the capacity to move once it has the instructions mm -hmm. or even gets to that point. The body mm -hmm. does not run every part. The body's not telling your heart to beat all the time. It basically knows that it needs to beat and it needs to regenerate itself. It needs to move this energy that it takes from its environment move it through the bloodstream which again is all part of the holographic part but it's moving the information moving oxygen moving whatever it mm -hmm. needs to move through the body but it's not you know the brain saying okay that runs everything and it's giving all those instructions so it knows in itself so each soul knows what it needs to do there is an overseeing different levels of oversouls and so forth that says okay mm -hmm. uh, this is the experience you know that it needs to be gained this is the part that needs to be done so mm -hmm. are you up to doing this and you can achieve it at these various places and then the soul will decide what it wants to do now um, there is a very organized team if you want to call it that that you know, like I was giving the analogy in the other interview, like the, like the painting you have behind you. I mean, mm -hmm. if you really look at it, there's a lot of different paint strokes, different colors, different blends mm -hmm. of whatever it is. But to make that picture, that all had to come together. So in essence, each soul is another facet, a tiny facet of that painting. So it says, okay, you need to express and experience and, and achieve whatever you need to achieve so you become part of that beautiful canvas that makes this beautiful uh, expanded picture mm -hmm. that we are going to do so the souls will come in and and uh, increase its coloration increase its uh, consciousness in that singular uh, viewpoint so that it can actually be part of that whole canvas but again like the example i gave the canvas is only a small part like if you took that painting behind you and we said okay this is the this is the ultimate of the painting but that painting is just a small part of what makes the rest of it because there's more and more because each piece mm -hmm. is a piece of the piece right until you get to the to the so forth now so in essence there is no hierarchy but there are more evolved souls that have achieved certain levels of wisdom and they uh, guide the ones that are still in progress going from source consciousness to forgetfulness and having only a small portion mm -hmm. of con uh, soul consciousness and then having all these experiences on different realms and different uh, expressions and planets and whatever or physicalities whatever you want to call it and while it's doing that, it's remembering, not only remembering what it is, but it's also expanding. Because the thing is, a soul does never start from one point, go into a point of forgetfulness, go through those experiences only to remember to bring it back to where it was. While yes. it's doing that, it's expanding. It's becoming grander 
than what it started off with. It's like anybody that, you know, goes into, uh, say, even taking a job as an analogy and mm -hmm. or a career, you're mm -hmm. not going to just go there and just do nothing and just play that career and then remember, oh, I don't need the career because I can retire now. You go there, but you're learning from it. You're growing from it. You're using more skills, more creativity. So by the time that you mm -hmm. retire, you're a lot wiser. But it's not just because of the career, but also all your interactions with people and all the interactions with the systems and whatever else. So you become wiser. And this is why the original design was, you know, the souls that have been around more are end up being the teachers uh, in a sense, but they're still always a student too. And when I say the teachers, you're only sharing your wisdom and information, but not only to repeat it, because if you share, say for your child, right, your daughter or whatever, mm -hmm. you're going to share wisdom with your daughter what you've learned, what you've experienced, what you've acknowledged, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Your daughter's not going to try to replicate you. It's not going to say, okay, mm -hmm. I'm, you, Dad, you have the ultimate, you're, you're it, and I'm going to follow <laughs> your, your path. No She's way. <laughs> no way. She's going to say, okay, great, thanks for the wisdom, but I'm going to go experience and play on my own terms mm -hmm. and figure things out on my own, and I'm going mm -hmm. to also try things that you haven't tried and also do what other people have done but I'm always going to do it differently. And what happens is she gains a whole different level of wisdom. So it takes your wisdom and adds much more to it, but it's also different because the, the choices you made, the chances mm -hmm. you've taken, the interaction, interactions you've had are going to be very different than what she's going to have. Not mm -hmm. only because she's a different person, the collective has changed. The environment has mm -hmm. changed. Who, the culture. The culture has changed. A lot of things have changed. So you can't even do it. Even if you wanted to repeat your life, like if you were given the opportunity to go back to your youth, you know, say you mm -hmm. were going to go back to 10 years old again, but you're taking this wisdom here and you say, I want to replicate when I was 10 years old. You might be back in the 10-year-old body, but what was interesting then would not have any interest for you now. And you would definitely make different choices. You would definitely go a different path because you have different wisdom levels. So yes. this is why the incarnation is always different because the soul brings the wisdom of previous lives, uh, wisdom that it's gained even in non-form when it wasn't in a physicality. Mm -hmm. It brings in the wisdom of being on other planets and it does so forth. So each time it shapes its environment and, and its dance of life differently mm -hmm. you can't repeat it i mean even in in um in life regressions that i have done for many years for people uh you know when you really look at it and you apply people back to that point in time the viewpoint is quite different and you can actually shift a lot of things in that particular experience that was adopted because of it so yes. yeah go ahead um reg regarding this this uh, let's say, I would say eternal wisdom, inter eternal and internal wisdom. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. I want to remember my, my, my soul experience. I want to remember my, my wisdom and, and be, uh, let's say, wiser and we'd say calmer as well. Calmer, you said? Calm. Calm. C-A-L-M. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, less prone to, to the drama, to the life dramas. Um, the wisdom balances me, balance us, I believe. Okay, so this is the kind of the um, um, the, the, the stress or, or the um, the gap between free will on one hand and wisdom. Let's say uh, tapping into the uh, soul wisdom. Okay, if I have. If I have the the free will, I would I am and will be defiant. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be dictated by let's say by the oversouls or let's say the society system, and I want to be creative and expressive as much as I want. Mm -hmm. That's the free will. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I want to tap my wisdom, and when when I tap my wisdom, okay, um, I I'm I'm losing my free will. On, so on because how, how how is that? I, I just want to because understand. when I tap my free will, I remember who I was, 
I uh, refrain from doing, let's say, old mistakes mm-hmm. or um, regain uh, uh, all the, I would say, uh, uh, fears. Okay. Uh, and so forth. So it's, it's a delicate balance. It's, a, it's kind of, uh, I would say, a dance of how much free will I access or how much soul wisdom. And currently, I'm very much, I would say, um, uh, aware and uh, very, um, I would say, cautious for, for my free will and, and my sovereignty. Mm-hmm. And I think that's come with spirituality, being sovereign, so accessing and understanding the sovereignty of the soul. And, and the drama. On the other hand, the wisdom, which I don't remember. I know that I had, I had some, uh, some uh, soul that I was, I, w- I would just say that humbly that I was much more wise than I am now. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, can you speak about this? Do you, do, do you, do you understand this distinction between free will and, and uh, the wisdom or do you accept it or do you feel that it's, there is any tension or it's, it's balanced and, and should merge? Well, it is pretty well balanced and, and it can easily merge and, and it actually has and continues to do so because as we access more of your wisdom, you balance it with the free will. Now, the free will you always have. You're never limited from free will unless you choose not to activate any of your free will. So you say, okay, mm-hmm. well, you know, I don't, but even that is free will. Even deciding that you don't want free will is free will. Okay. So if you bring back wisdom of other experiences and you say, well, I don't want to make these mistakes, like you said, uh, it's not really so much looking at it and saying, well, I made a mistake. That's from a mind perspective viewpoint. Mm-hmm. And that also changes the, the form of how much free will we have. It's really looking at whatever you've experienced before and, so, and looking at it from a viewpoint where, okay, great. I had that experience. What did I gain from it? What did I learn? What did I experience? What did I do with it? And how can I utilize it in this reality now? Maybe I want only a little piece. Maybe I want a big chunk of it. But that's how it actually works. But if the mind interferes because of programs, and it goes, oh, my God, look, I made a mistake. I did this. I don't want to repeat that. I got to be very cautious. I got to do this. I got to do that. It totally reshapes uh, your, your experience. And, of course, you can make yourself quite small in that respect. So even in life regressions, when I was going with people and doing that, we always brought the highest level of consciousness that we put in, even though I was uploading the consciousness with them uh, and going into it, because Mm -hmm. what happens is the perception of that past life, for example, that, okay, Mm -hmm. I I said the wrong thing and I I got killed, okay, because I spoke out and they thought I was a witch or whatever, you know, or a warlock, whatever you want to call it. And now I got to be very careful. I cannot speak. I cannot say anything because you know, I'm going to do an interview and I say all this stuff and I can be persecuted or, you know, uh, condemned or whatever it is Mm -hmm. that can come in. But the wisdom that comes in and saying, wait a minute, do I really need to have that experience? Do I actually have the choice to change that or even not even engage? When you have that wisdom coming in, which you're kind of tapping into your essence of who you are, even if you bring a small facet of it, you realize, well, that's, I have the freedom to decide what I want to experience or not, and if I engage in that or not. But even if you do decide to engage, it won't be something of long term because it's not possible for you. In, in a way, when you really look at it, that particular experience was what you needed then. What you need now is completely different. So the freedom we have, the wisdom we have accessibility to, the forgetfulness, of course, becomes a hinder, but it's also a constructed hinder that we've decided. But at the same time, with all of that coming into play and, and utilizing any part of that, you still are designing every part of it, designing every part of your life through 
free will. So you could say and say, well, okay, there's a hierarchy, there's a construct on the physical level, okay? We came on planet Earth and really we don't have the freedom to create our reality, okay? And that was purposely designed at one point where we were kind of entering at a certain density, we were coming in at a certain, uh, what do you call, dimensional consciousness, and we would play there. And we made sure that we, we really engaged in that and didn't give ourselves the opportunity to get out until we came to the realization that we can actually leave. So that was an organized agreement that you made. But mm -hmm. we've also come to the, the point where we're coming to that realization. We're also seeing that it, really I have the freedom now with the gained wisdom and with my curiosity and everything that I'm looking at it that I could actually choose how much I want to engage in that and not. So I can actually shift my dimensional consciousness. I can shift my density uh, perspective and frequency or vibration, if you want to call it that, because that's what it is, uh, mm -hmm. and start shaping my reality around that. And in fact, that even though you're playing on planet Earth, there's many, many, many layers of it so that your surrounding world starts to change mm -hmm based on what choices you will make. And that's with, again, your own free will, with your own gaining of your own wisdom. People get lost and connect, uh, get caught in, uh, you know, looking at their past and seeing that is a mistake. Like, for example, even in this life, if you look at through your life, and this is, applies mm -hmm. to everybody, you look at your life and you made choices. You had certain experiences. Some were nice, some were adopted as the idea not so nice and some of it got you into situations that you would have less than preferred to get into so at this point in time you know based on the collective consciousness and when i'm saying consciousness of the 3d world based on what other people have told you based on your interpretation you may have labeled it identified that this was wrong this was wrong this was a bad choice this was this and this and now here you are today, still living part of that and saying, well I, well, I can't say this, I can't do this, I can't make that because look, I made exactly. those mistakes, right? Those are programs. Those, those are fears. Correct, correct. And those fears are only capable to maintain while we are still in an unconscious state. Of realization because you can be easily bought into the whole idea I'm afraid of you know some deity up there uh, too and to mm -hmm. add it a, a, an extra level and say well you know I came through this religion or I came through this culture I came through this upbringing and now you know I have not only screwed up here but I'm making you know choices that can you know determine my afterlife sort of thing but those are ideas as you come to the further realization you see the perfection because the perfection, what is? What is this perfection? The perfection is we make choices. We make choices based on the consciousness that we want to play with. We base it on the experiences we want to play with. We have always had the freedom to decide what would best serve us because we're not coming in with the same agenda that we get programmed to believe, that we come into an agenda mm -hmm. where we grow up. We get a good education, we get a good job, you raise some kids, you do this, and there's a really nice orderly fashion that we're gonna do it, and there's right things and wrong things, and I need to be accepted and loved by others, and I need to do, so that's how the conditioning and program is. It's a playbook. Yes, correct. But we, our freedom and our choice that we have, that we relinquish for a period of time, is that there's the playbook and of course the playbook is going to be different there's 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 chapters in this playbook mm -hmm. there's chapters in saying uh there's the first chapter is being in a human body these are certain things i get to play with that i'm in a male or female human body so chapter two is about male or female mm -hmm. chapter three is about your upbringing cultures and whatever else the chapter four is going to be in the playbook of how it is in your region and the area of your world and what is playing there and what is being dictated in that respect. Mm -hmm. The next 
uh, chapter is was acceptable and not acceptable as a human species of this 3D world or whatever it may be. And you go on further and further. Each chapter has another level, but this mm -hmm. playbook is a playbook. But the playbook is up to you what chapters you want to play with. It's up to you if you will even want to play with any of the chapters. Or you say, I'm going to play with some of these chapters for a little while, and then I'm going to say, okay, not, not interested in that anymore, and that anymore, and that anymore. So this is what the awakening is happening, where people come to realize this is the playbook, and I've played, and I've been part of this playbook, but at this point in time, I don't want some of these chapters as part of my experience anymore, because not that I'm going to judge it as a horrible experience. I'm going to see it as, okay, I've done that. I've experienced what I wanted to experience. Mm -hmm. I've gained what I've needed to gain. I don't need to be in that limit because each chapter of the playbook in a way represents to a limited, more limited uh, access to free will, more limited to access of who you are uh, and to actually go out and be more that creative being that you are. Because okay. if you're buying into the particular chapter and you follow it word for word, you will see that your world is quite small. It's quite limited. It's like you live in this little box. And then, you, of course, you have more boxes because each chapter is another box, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's up to you how much of it you want to engage in it. Mm -hmm. But then you start realizing, like you are there, David. You're starting to realize that you are playing very small. And that may have been comfortable before because of fear, because fear makes us play small, yes. especially if you're afraid of repercussion, if you're afraid of being judged, if you're afraid of being reprimanded, if you're afraid of, uh, I can make a mistake or that I'm going to offend people or I'm going to offend, you know, the higher orders shame. or deities. Shame. 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 And yes. Sh shame and scarcity. Correct. So you see that each one of us, uh, each one of those actually creates, you know, a nice little thing. And you say, okay, well, you know, if I fit in, if I follow this playbook completely, mm -hmm. then I might just save myself from all those levels of fear. Okay. But while you're doing that, you're still going to have some of them anyways. And while you're doing that, you see that life is very small. And then you get really buy into the fact is like, I have no free will. I have no free choice. I have, I don't have the capacity to live outside of what I've been dictated because I've been given this playbook. The realization that we are coming to now mm -hmm. and what we're, yes. is that the playbook is fictional. The playbook was all, you know, collectively designed by mm -hmm. your each group. But the playbook was never for you to adhere to, to become your guidance. It might be to start off with, oh, okay, this is a good way to understand some of this stuff. And so I can really appreciate the, uh, the different levels, all the different chapters and the different boxes. But you come to a point where you say, don't need this one, don't need this one, don't need this one and this one. And then you now start designing your life completely much more open than what you've done. Yeah. I, I would, I think that I'm quite unique in this manner that I'm quite, uh, uh, I would say self-reflective, mm -hmm. but most of the people, I would say most, uh, I now I kind of categorize religious people of all sorts. Most of the time they don't really have choices. They, they br bring up, kind of brought up into their religion. If you were a Muslim, a Buddhist or a Christian or whatever, in whatever part of the world and and those let's say people souls they don't really understand that they have any other choice because they they didn't investigate or expose themselves to other ideas mm -hmm. so they drink and and eat what they're in their region they don't they, they don't even know how to read okay mm -hmm. so how those people, souls can evolve. Let's say, I know, let's say a uh, shaman, shaman and uh, indigenous shamans, they have uh, what's called um, the dream space mm. where they can connect and communicate. 
And therefore, their experience that they say, uh, imagination resources are much broader than ours. So how can, let's say, a person who is not, let's say, a literate like I am, okay, can evolve spiritually and, and learn to, uh, let's say, dissolve these, these boundaries and limitations? Let's say he, if he lives in, 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 a, in a small village in the Amazon. Let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, you made an excellent point uh, for that because uh, each soul, each individual has the same opportunity, yes. So if they were brought up in the religion dictation of how life is, okay, they may choose and you could say, well, they don't really have a choice because they, like you said, they don't have the enough uh, capacities to start looking, inquiring, researching, reading, you know, uh, accessing anything. Mm -hmm. And so they're limited. Those particular souls realize that, okay, I may stage my life that I don't have these options, or at least the idea that I don't have these options, that there's nothing outside of what I'm going to, and they're going to play that role for extended period of time, could be for this whole lifetime. Now, it could be for most of its lifetime, but near the end, it starts to break out of it. It has that choice, even though it's not aware. Now, the soul has a certain level of wisdom, okay? So the soul, as it will start pushing along, and this is what's happening right now. A lot of people's soul is pushing mm -hmm. harder than it's ever pushed before. The collective consciousness is pushing in a way. Uh, energies, frequencies, so forth, the interactions, the different people that are coming along, the, the accessibility to technologies like, for example, the internet, the information, there are more people awakening in the groups and showing something outside of that. So there is more opportunities going that. Are we expecting that every single one will awaken? No. But they have the freedom to say, Okay, in this lifetime, I don't want to achieve that. In this lifetime, I really want to get lost in, in that and gain what I can from it. Because it knows it's eternal at a soul perspective, of course. At the mind level, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, let me ask you a personal question, and it's yeah. free to answer it. Were you brought up in any form of religion? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, and and um, I would say my, my father was... Uh, his religion was being uh, um, uh, secular, okay? Uh, in Israel, there's the secular people and the observant people, mm -hmm. and there's a tension between them. It's everywhere in the world. And um, my father was a Holocaust survivor, mm -hmm. and his, his uh, family was an uh, observant and religious family. And he decided that uh, losing his family, he, he, he is losing his, um, his um, religious background. Mm -hmm. And he brought us as uh, very secular. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when I was a teenager, I, st I started to look at all kinds of, uh, I would say, spiritual teachings, including the, uh, uh, the Jewish mysticism. But at a certain point in the, every mysticism, they have a, a place of, I would say, um, um, limit, limitation or construction mm -hmm. that if you want to be with us, you have to follow this, these guidelines. Correct. You, you have to follow uh, the orders of God. And we tell you and we, we will, uh, I would say, proxy God for you. And I saw it in, in a few, few religions, and I kind of, um, I would say, uh, collected my own w wisdom. But I'm still on the path, and I think that the best, okay, the most important uh, teaching for myself is connecting to the, or tapping into the soul wisdom, mm -hmm. inner soul wisdom. And uh, what, what is the question is, 
how, how people who are not, who are brought religion, into religion, can tap into their own, let's say, um, soul wisdom and reconnect to, to the internal wisdom that they guides them and dissolves, let's say, the control structure. Right. It could be on, say, on our modern, modern society. It could be on a very, uh, let's say, indigenous society. And I, I have, um, I remember one, one of my lifetimes, uh, I was uh, a young uh, teenage, teenager. I was uh, uh, instructed to get married to, uh, to a girl that I didn't like, something like that. I was a male. And I rebelled and uh, I went out of the village and I was uh, eaten by wild animal. <laughs> That's it. So, so as there, there are implications. Whatever choice we take, there are implications. Well, yes and no, because in essence, yes, there is an implication if you look at it, but in essence, you didn't want to go into that life stream, so you walked away from it. But walking away for what you really wanted to create was not what, the, uh, from a soul perspective, saying, okay, we don't need that, so that's, that's leave, the, leave the planet, and how better way, let the wild animals eat me, it doesn't matter, because I'm eternal anyways, and that's a choice, you know, that was made at the time. It wasn't because I made that choice. So in essence, if you really tap into the soul's wisdom, it preferred that option of being eaten and come out of the, of the physicality's limitation in that particular life stream than to go into that very closed up life stream that was not resonating with you at that point in time. Now, it may have resonated for a long period of time, say, okay, I want to play the game, I want to play the game. But now it's like, no, I don't want to play this game anymore. And so you decided to, to not engage in that next level of the game because that would have made your world even smaller because now there's a responsibility because now you have to marry this person. You have to play a specific role and now you're following two sets of families worth of rules and structures and upbringing and belief systems and so forth. Plus you take in a partner that has its, their own belief systems and so forth. So all of that becomes in there and say, hey, you know something? I'm better off checking out. So uh, I'm going to re-enter another time because I've already done whatever I wanted to do at this point uh, at this point but that's not what I wanted to choose so that's how that part works and I know sometimes the mind has a difficult time understanding that but the question I asked you about regarding your religion for a period of time did you become totally embraced uh, totally engaged in the religion the secular part of it that your father and other people in your family um, were abiding to for a while before you started questioning it? Uh, no, it was not a religion. It was, I would say, guidelines. Okay. And there was time that when I was uh, researching uh, uh, Judaism and Kabbalah uh, that I started to be fearsome, fearsome of, of God and, 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 uh, and the implication of being non-observant. Let's say not not for uh, doing the Shabbat, uh, not observing the Shabbat and so forth. Right, right. So, so um, after after a while, I was able to dissolve those fears. But I was, I realized that I'm doing, let's say the the religious mitzvah or or uh, or uh, what's called the mitzvah uh, abidings. It was from fear based. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had uh, friends that were uh, observant, and for them it was not fear-based, it was more a cultural uh, structure. Right. Because they were, and they are still are not willing to let go of those uh, uh, behaviors because it is, uh, has, uh, say, social implications. Right. And, and we have we have some some uh, few uh, few cases in Israel of uh, young uh, uh, ultra orthodox uh, uh, females that uh, commit uh, uh, suicide 
because uh, they don't want to abide to, to the religious uh, uh, controlling system. And uh, they actually are brought up to be slaves. Mm -hmm. And they see what's about and, and, and letting go of, of their current society is letting go of, of, their, of, of their beloved one. It's like being, uh, um, uh, being dead for the family. The family sit seven, uh, Shiva, let's say, if you say uh, you rebel, they uh, deport you. And they are thinking the ultra auto jokes and, and they sit uh, seven of you and you're like a dead person. Mm -hmm. So some people kill themselves. Right. Especially uh, young females. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a choice saying, okay, I've had my experience and, and I choose not to uh, participate in the rest of it. Even though at a mind level, it might be thinking, well, this is the only option I have. I don't want to play that. And if I commit suicide, I don't have to, I don't have to endure that, that part of life. So it's, it's giving the soul another freedom and saying, okay, uh, I, you know, as much as you have to understand it doesn't matter what your situation is, even taking the example you gave of those, the, the girls uh, that, you know, commit suicide. That's a choice because it turns around and says, you know something, I'm going to find a way out and I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave this and go find another place. Okay. Because of the programming and so forth, they may not see that option and they may not want to exercise that option, but there's always the freedom. I know that's hard to understand sometimes and say, well, you know, the, the situation is so uh, tight and closed and so forth that, you know, really mm -hmm. what choice do they have? What option do they have? Can they actually do any of that? But in, in fact, at a soul level, we all do. You, you, you've heard, and I'm sure that you've seen many examples where people have been in the most devastating, what we consider devastating situations mm -hmm. and walked away from it uh, with, you know, great uh, challenge, if you want to call it that. But I would say courage. They, courage. Courage, yeah. And they've, they've done that. Uh, and they've actually redesigned their life. And, and they're the ones that are a lot of times end up teaching others how to, to be able to get that courage and step out of the programming and, and belief systems. So the option is always there, you know. Um, and my reason, my question was because at some point, even though while you were looking for all of that, through fear, saying, well, you know, I'm not following the, the different uh, whatever, parts of the religion uh, because of the fact if I don't do that, you know, something horrible is going to happen to me or something. Like you said, the fears mm -hmm. and the social, being the social outcast and whatever else that may be there uh, involved. When you're really looking at all of that, at some point, there's a part of you that's saying, you know something, as much as there's fear, I'd really want to explore more. So you start taking little bits and pieces and you start looking into it and you start going into it. And then that starts to shift with you because what happens is the programming that was with the fear starts to lose its power, starts to lose its, its rigidity. It starts to lose its foundation that holds it mm -hmm. up because the foundation is a belief, a story or something that, you know, we've, adopted or taken on so it starts to look at that and 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 starts to see oh okay you know i don't know if this holds water if this is actually strong enough to to for me to hang on to this fear and, okay. and that's that's how it goes like with myself i was brought up in a very religious catholic family okay and my mother being she wanted to be a nun and and she want, and she really practiced that heavily but then she was put into an arranged marriage uh, with my father at the time because they didn't want more people uh, in the family to go into the religious order because they, you know, they already had two in the religious order already that were one was playing a nun, one was playing a priest or whatever it was. And uh, so at that point in time says, oh, no, we need to have, you know, family expanding so you need to get married and and here this is a person we selected you get to marry this person right mm -hmm. yeah but her religious part of it came into her life and she played it uh, heavily and my father of course you know was not here or there but he followed it through like you said fear oh well if i don't follow this something horrible is going to happen to me so i will go to church i will do this i will do that but it was not through conviction 
It was through fear. My mother was through conviction. So being raised with that and having the level of understanding that I had, I questioned everything because as far as I was concerned, who made the stuff up? Because as far as my viewpoint was, where are you getting this information from? Because I had a certain number of it. It's like, oh, the, you know, the priests say this, the Pope says this, the book says this, we call the Bible or whatever it is. You know, it's, this is the way it is. And I go, who wrote all this stuff? Who made it up? Who, who actually has all these connections? You know, so I would ask those questions. But for a period of time, I followed it through. Like I did follow the religion thing, more for curiosity how it felt. But at the same time, I also saw, like you were saying earlier, that this is what you believe. You do not question anything. And we tell you what to follow, what not to follow, and what God wants. And, what God, <laughs> and I am a representative of God. That's what they were saying. I'm a representative of God, and I have to do his work. Uh, so I tell you when you get disciplined what to say, do, think, whatever yes. it was, right? So that's yes. how it worked. So at some that's point, religion. So go ahead. Uh, that's religion, but uh, there are, let's say, very oppressive regimes and, uh, and societies. If we look at, let's say, a uh, totalitarian regime like North Korea on one hand, mm -hmm. or a uh, very strict uh, uh, family, uh, uh, mat no, uh, paternalistic uh, societies like uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia or in Africa, where, where, the, the, where the females are slaves, actually really slaves. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and, and I, I interviewed someone from Africa and, and she explained, there's no way out. I, I have no, no alternative, let's say, I have no other society to, uh, let's say, to, um, uh, to go for. And the, which is more liberal and I will be more accepted and so forth as it is now in Israel. Okay? Mm -hmm. And she is in Israel and she, she explained to me how it is in Israel. But in, in Africa, in the villages, uh, on the small towns, it's extremely oppressive to women. Correct, yeah. And there's no way out. Yes, uh, from a perspective of how they're looking at, there's no way out. Let, let me ask you a question. Do you feel that a soul is sent to a particular culture, a particular part of the world with no choice or even understanding of what it has as the stage of play and the opportunities within it and the limits within it? Well, my understanding and my, let's say, internal wisdom says that many uh, souls, especially on the less evolved, are manipulated. And are manipulated at, would say, at the uh, soul review conference, okay? And it is kind of guided to look at this wrongdoing and that wrongdoing and how to mend it up in the same, uh, say, a construct or the same uh, um, society again and again and again. And they are kind of trying to remand or reprimand uh, the society and themselves, while I would say, well, they made choice, but they not really made choice. Like, let's say, I, when I want to, uh, when, when the kids were, were, were little, I gave them choice. Okay, you can go to bed with the green pyjama or the red pyjama. Okay, that was the choice. It's not really a choice. They're going to bed. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was a fake choice, right? And 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 same thing I think with kind of less evolved um, souls are making let's say lesser let's say less important choices about where they're going to play the next game, and they they are kind of uh, manipulated well, and harvested. Yeah, I mean you could look at that and like for example your kids. You know, say you're going to bed with this color pajama or that color pajama, um, but you're going to bed. But if your child agreed, disagreed with you and decided, I'm not going to bed anyways, uh, and I want to stay up, they could have. And, you know, would there be some repercussions? To some degree, yes. However, 
it was their choice if there was going to be a repercussion or not because they can actually play you and say, well, daddy, you know, I want to stay up and so forth. Yes, you're not going to. Because, I mean, I have children too or had children. My children are still there, but they're grown up now. But, um, you know, if my – and there was a similar situation. No, I didn't give the red or green pajama uh, part of it. But, you know, I would say, okay, it's best to go to sleep now so that you are refreshed in the morning and you can, you know, feel better in the morning. And there were some occasions where um, they insisted, especially uh, one of them, and insisted that, no, I want to stay up, whatever, right? And I want to stay up. I said, okay, you can stay up, but we're going to bed. So, yeah, you're on your own, you know? Um, or if they had to go to bed earlier than us, let them stay up. And then, of course, in the morning, if they didn't want to wake up, I said, well, see, because you went to bed late, you're not feeling well this morning. You feel really tired, but you still have to go to school next. You know? So you're going to get up anyways, right? And, and if they didn't want to go to school, well, you could stay home. But your friends or whatever it is. So I gave them the opportunity to make choices, and they've made some of those choices. But then they realized that it wasn't a high, for their highest benefit anyways. Because it's like, oh, yeah, if I go to bed early, I feel better in the morning. I can get to go to school and play with my friends and be whatever. And I'm not going to miss out on anything that I have to catch up later. I think that's mm -hmm. a better choice. But they had to come to that realization after several times that, you know, they tested it, right? Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the, the thing, the the essence of your story is trust. They trust your advice. Mm -hmm. the 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 essence of of good parenthood is is having trust and and um, and, and honor and um, respect. Respect yeah. among, am, among the children and 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 the the, and the parents. And uh, in the way that I learned about uh, the, let's say the the soul life review, okay, is it really on a on a, on a level of trust, lots of of a child to parents, or is it really more than a manipulative of, uh, let's say, a governing society to a, a to its citizens. Okay, let me ask you a question then. I want you to tap into your higher self. So you're going to ask your higher self that question. Without what you learned and what you heard. Okay, let's take mm -hmm. that out of the equation from the mind. So tap into it. In this review, are we manipulated and we really are what you had question basically asked are we being manipulated mm -hmm. and guided so that we can go in and refeed that same construct or whichever you said it so if you tap into that okay. take, take okay. a moment. My, my inner guidance is that the way it goes in the review is more like going to a, 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 a psychotherapist which follows you mm -hmm. the reviewer follows the soul where she goes and they don't, uh, let's say, um, direct her, the mm -hmm. soul. The soul take its own directions, and uh, the reviewers ask questions about the um, uh, uh, the decisions that the souls took, mm -hmm. and eventually the soul make its own direction. Correct. But as long as the souls make its own direction and is not uh, exposed to more options, as as I'm fortunate to have as a as an educated person, okay, it is limited, and in that respect, it is governed. Yes, but you know the thing is. The soul has access to what it wants to have as resource and understanding and knowledge, whatever you want to call it, experience. The thing is, the difference is that whenever you're not in a physical form with a mind that has a, pro, a series of programs, conditioning, and so forth, the viewpoint is very different from a soul perspective. It does not have the same limits. It does not have the same... 
ideas. So what may seem like going to a third world country as on a human perspective is something horrible, okay? From a soul perspective, it's like, oh, look at that. I get to go play with that. I get to see what starvation is like. I get to see how, you know, being uh, in a physical body that may be painful or doesn't have its basic essentials. It's like, oh, I never had that. Let me go try that. Let me go play with that aspect of it. And I always have the out. Now, of course, when they get into the body and the programs come in, that level of consciousness gets greatly limited but it's going to do whatever it's going to do as part of that experience. Now, I'm going to share something with you. We've all had many lives, and we all go through that review process, okay? And most of us don't have a real good recollection or remembrance of that experience, but some of us do. And I recall having many other lives uh, and bits and so forth. But let's take that out of the equation. Last year, February 15th, 2016, I died. Yes. The body di checked out. Okay? I left my body. I was not in physical form. I mean, the body was dead on a bed, mm -hmm. and I left the body. Okay? I opened this exit door to be able to, even though I had a contract and agreement to stay here till 2077. That's my contract. That's the agreement at a soul level, which I know of, and I have a remembrance of that. And of course, I have my guides and so forth that remind me, you know, you have this. And also other agreements that I made. So I left the body. Left the body because the body became super compromised, and at a mind level, it was like, this is not worth it anymore. And of course, the body shut down. There was many implications of it, ill, disease, health, and whatever else. So when I left the body, I ended up meeting with my guide for my review. And here I am in front of my guide for the review. Now, the first question I was asked, why are you here? I said, I, first of all, at that time, I didn't really realize fully where I was. I go, first of all, I don't know where I am because I'm looking at that. I'm in this vast space floating in the center of what looks like a huge bubble. And here you are in front of me. And I left the body and I saw myself leaving the body. I saw myself lying in bed and I kind of figured that I died. Something happened. And I kind of mm -hmm. knew it was happening anyways because my body was shutting down anyways. And... Uh, so I'm here, and he says, well, you died, and you're here. So I'm here to give you the review. We're going to take a look at your life, and you decide what you want to do. If you want to respect and honor the, the original agreement, or you want to leave behind what you left. So at that point, I had, not at the mind level, but at the soul level, a perspective as like, I'm really not accomplishing what I really wanted to accomplish coming onto the planet. Okay, taking on a human form. Mm -hmm. So with the review, I was shown my life. I was shown each choice I made, each interaction I had, each message I shared, all the people I worked with and so forth, and how it created a chain reaction of whatever was going on. After the review, I realized that there was more that I had accomplished or did as part of my agreement than I was actually really seeing from the human perspective point, mm -hmm. and even at the soul level at that point in time. And then I was asked the question, so what do you want to do? Do you want to go back, or do you want to carry on in non-form and uh, do whatever you want to do from there? And realizing that, uh, okay, you know, I don't think it's great, uh, a perfectly opportune time to leave, because of certain things I've got started and I wanted to really accomplish from a soul perspective, not from the mind perspective, from a soul perspective, because this is just the soul talking to my guide, which is also mm -hmm. another uh, grander aspect of myself or soul. And looking at that, I came to the decision after several things of what was interconnected with that and the fact that I had also other connections to that, that it was better to come back. Well, for me to come back, I had to re-agree to my rest of my agreement to be here until 2077, which I thought, well, that's another 60 years. 
Hmm. <laughs> you know, well, actually, it was 61 years at the time. I go, that's another 61 years plus. Hmm. Okay, and I'm in a compromised physicality that basically bar barely functions mm -hmm. and, you know, and so forth. But, okay, if we can get this thing going, I'm, w I'm willing to go back there and do it. So I came back in the body. It was a painful experience because you have a body that, first of all, died. Second of all, it was already still compromised, and it had to repair itself, and I needed to have some assistance in that repair. So that happened a year and a half ago, approximately. And it gave me an opportunity to create a shift within myself that I was able to, you know, actually redirect myself so that the body started to repair, even though it has been a very a challenging and I'm not in perfect health mm -hmm. by any means but it also shifted a lot of the perspective and how to share the message and how to do other things even though I'm not fully uh, active in that at the moment I'm, I am doing certain things but not to the full uh, level I would like to. Are you more relaxed now? Yes and I have that dual perspective that's a little stronger than it was before. Like I, I see the human experience and I must say, even with what I was gaining with, with my accessibility, I saw my physicality as a hindrance, as a, uh, as a weak point. I saw my physicality and my human experience as a challenge because of the fact that it had limits that I had accepted as part of the experience because I really needed to understand the human experience. I had to go right into the depth of it. And I had agreed it with that originally, but after some time you get to the point you get worn out of it and say, okay, you know, this is getting a little too old now. I'm not having that much fun with this, you know, and it's time to, to shift it. But the shifting started to reject the body so then the body picked up a disease and it started to fall apart and it started to fail organs and, you know, started to have all that stuff. And it was, and I knew it was because in a way I gave the, the body the instructions is, Oh, you're a weakness. I don't need you. Uh, and the body started, Oh, you don't need me. Then I'm going to shut down. But I didn't quite understand that relationship at that time. And of course mm -hmm. it just deteriorated and deteriorated and deteriorated. And that's what brought me to where I was. But then I had to make a whole new agreement with my body to say, okay, we're in it together as a team. And I need you and you need me. I'm the soul and I need, your I need the body to be here. Mm -hmm. And I can't do what I need to do without it. Because mm -hmm. if I could, I would stay in non-form. I could stay in, without being a in a body, without being on the planet. I can still do like I was doing before you know, visiting mm -hmm. and just taking drop-ins and coming and going, right? But I needed to have this full integration for, you know, long-term too. So we need to rearrange this. We need to come up with a way that we can be harmonious in this respect. So that's what in, in followed through from that. And, you know, things started to repair and started to become better. So you're seeing a better version of me than you would have seen, you know, a few years ago or a year and a half ago. When you know, now that happened in February, I cannot say that things repaired itself very quickly because in essence, I entered that checkout point twice in October of the same year in 2016 and pulled out of death twice. Mm -hmm. um, but that time I knew, oh, okay, I'm losing this kind of reparative aspect of the physicality and the body started to shut down, was shutting down basically, had done so. And uh, so it was kind of restarted. I won't go into the rest of the details because it's a long story. But the point is, I had to kind of see that part of it as soul perspective and also giving you the example that you do go through the review and I had the freedom, I could have just left. But at a soul's consciousness and understanding, it was, you know, I'd be better off going and finishing what I decided to, to, to partake in because I know that this is beneficial on a, a larger scale than just the individualization of me, okay? Because on a human perspective saying, what am I gonna gain from this? 
I, it's not, I've been there, done that, you know, I'm a planet jumper, I've come from one planet to another, and I'm from a whole different universe. It's like, why am I here? Because of, of service, I decided to, to, to be of service to facilitate. So I'm going to finish that. That's what I came here to do, and that's what I'm going to do. We all have that opportunity of review. Now, in essence, that was very instrumental for me to have that experience because uh, I can talk about it. I can assure people that that is available for everyone. It's not just for me. You know, it's for everyone. Mm -hmm. And definitely, when you, if you asked me the question, how does it feel to be in the physical form, before that point, I would have said exactly what I was saying before. Limited, this, that, whatever it was. But asking me later, after mm -hmm. the fact of that experience, it was more, okay, I see how the value of being in this form has been renewed because I knew that coming in, but it was renewed. So uh, definitely you see things very differently because of it. So in entering of any life, like even if I look back at my past life that I was here over 200 years ago, I, I have that recollection mm -hmm. and I remember looking at it. My last life before this one that I was here for 200 years ago, I was a monk. And I lived in the Himalayan mountains. I did not connect with humans that much on a collective scale, but I was a teacher. I was teaching other monks or want to be monks mm -hmm. and so forth. And when I look at that life and look at this life, this life has much more enrichment in it in regards to my experience and what I'm doing rather than that point in time where I was teaching a few groups of people uh, for whatever period of time I was on the planet and left, okay? Uh, I did not get in, you know, married or had children or anything of that nature. I just basically wanted to teach. And that's what I was doing, teaching higher consciousness, teaching wisdom of at a soul perspective, but wisdom of your, what you can call spirituality. But in this lifetime, it was like, okay, I need to engage this. So when I saw this opportunity, I'm coming from a perspective, and I'm talking about a soul perspective, and looking at that, I was, wow, I'm going to go in a very dense family, very religious oriented. I'm going to, I had agreements to marry certain people uh, at certain points as partnership, and you could see their level of consciousness at the time, and I'm going, Okay, that's going to be really colorful. That's going to be very interesting from a soul perspective. Mm -hmm. Then I came here, and of course, I'm looking at the world. And to me, as far as I was seeing from my understanding, is that holy smokes, this planet's full of walking zombies that run on programs that really create more zombies. I'm not being disrespectful here. I'm just kind mm -hmm. of a perspective because I have full respect for the human experience because it's amazing. But to me at the time, it's going, wow, how am I supposed to help shift this when they're so close-minded? Well, of course, things changed over the years, many, many years later, and it was a great experience for me uh, to be able to teach better to be able to assist better, to be able to understand the human condition and get into the actual operating system because of all of that. Now, this is 60 years later. I'm at my <laughs> midpoint. So last <laughs> Friday was my midpoint of my agreement to be here. Mm -hmm. You know, So 60 years later, I see a whole different world and I see the whole human experience very differently because of those 60 years. But I've always seen, even with people that have had very limited, because I can tap into people very easily. It's a gift that you know I activated within myself in this journey to see that even in the most mind closed-minded state, there's still a wisdom that is residing from a soul perspective, and I never really see a soul um, hijacked or completely closed off it may have been given directions it may have seen it as not that hard to be able to incarnate in that particular culture and upbringing and that particular physicality being male or female or whatever it is at the time 
And then, of course, it has a completely different perspective when it's been here for a while and it's been oppressed and it's been a slave-like uh, experience. So there's a whole different viewpoint of that that um, uh, that you know experience. But in essence, I still see them. Okay, I'm going to do this for a while. I'm going to do this because I see the bigger picture. The bigger picture is not only about my individualization; it's mm -hmm. about the whole collective. Right. Okay. But at the mind level, they're not seeing that. Okay. From from your perspective, mm -hmm. everything is balanced. What about uh, the scenario that is playing here about uh, victimhood and the drama of polarity of evil and good, mm -hmm. of let's say of uh, higher higher levels that let's say our uh, that this planet is a prison planet for souls and they are being harvested for the, the louche, for this, the uh, anger, the fear, and, and uh, what's the last thing? Cast in, and the hate. Okay, mm -hmm. those are the, the harvested uh, emotions that are, there are, there are you, humans are brought up to feed, let's say, the other, uh, let's say, uh, controllers. What's, what's your point on this? Okay. So that was an excellent question. Um, and there's that strong belief that exists out there. So my question to you, when you tap to yourself, how much of that is actually what is taking place of what you just said? Is it 100%? Um, is it only a small percentage? What is your your viewpoint? Coming, forget about the mind, my, heart. Okay, my my, um, my hunch is two thirds is correct, and lots lots of it is uh, thought forms that created by humans, mm -hmm. but there are uh, controlling uh, uh, let's say uh, ETs that are trying to take over and to. Uh, um, dominate, okay, this is part of the game of duality that requires the, in essence, uh, the battle in order to, to get muscles, to, to, to learn your strengths, you have to, to get uh, uh, opposition mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to, ex to exercise yourself. Correct. So, so there must be some kind of opposition. Correct. And, and some, and, and there also, uh, I learned in the law of one that um, the choice, uh, the sole choice to go through this, do the service to self is as honored as this, the this service to others, because it's also leading to the same path. Correct. Okay. And there are lessons that you learn on the service to self uh, or that you cannot learn on the service to others and eventually it should be balanced correct excellent so even if we tap into so with what you're saying with the ets they're actually playing a role for us is that what you're saying yes they play a role, they play a role for us and we play a role for them as well correct correct it's like a marriage correct Exactly. So eventually what happens, even, uh, even with the idea of karma and all of that stuff, because that's not really, well, let me ask you the question, because I, I prefer your, to hear your perspective, uh, only because of your perspective plays a role in this. So what's, first of all, what's your understanding of karma or do you even uh, to abide to it in any form? Uh, my understanding for karma is karma is uh, the implication of choices. Mm -hmm. It says is the in physics there's the in Newtonian physics it's cause it's based on causality. There is event that causes another event, mm -hmm. and karma is eventually in the philosophical manner is the basis for of causality. If you do take this choice, there's implication and the cause another another event mm -hmm. and it's nothing about uh being bad or or, or 
or uh, or good it's it's just implication and it's uh that's that's one part of the karma the other part of karma is the law of attraction uh same attract the same unlike the physics in physics uh, opposite attracts mm -hmm. uh, in electricity and other forms but uh, in spirituality same attracts the same so when when you're aware of your karma you're aware of what you attract in your life right so this is my understanding which is one is causality causality being and second is attraction right okay because even with that i mean the understanding too with the kabbalah, kabbalah i think or other a lot of different uh, spiritual practices whatever you've done in your past life you have to pay in this lifetime or you have to you know and and, and I, I i don't endorse the, the payment the right, payment right. And, and and the sin part and being seen mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, all that part of uh, of uh, uh, reprimension being reprimanded and uh, what sorts uh, uh, and and having being pardoned by higher authorities because we are we are i am the higher authority for myself and for my creation Perhaps. that's how i that's how i take it but if i say that to other people oh boy i'm gonna have so much on my on my head <laughs> uh, so i keep myself silent and i follow my own religion i would say my own understanding and and if people ask me i tell them how i see how i see things with the, with the connection with the, their religion uh, let's say terms and and concepts but eventually it's it's full responsibility and full responsibility is extremely i would say fearful to many people and yeah you know not accept full responsibility mm -hmm. I mean, a good way to do to to deal with that, and this this is something I learned through my own experience here, um, is that I don't tell people what is. I ask questions. You know, if they say, you know, if they um, if they have a certain belief and they're holding on to the belief, I would easily ask them, okay, you, you strongly believe in this. How how do you actually feel about it? You know, uh, you know, just ask them. Uh, the question of not only how they feel about it, but in essence, if you didn't have to hold on to that, how would you see your life? You know, or whatever. You know, I would play with with that because, you know, I my family and my uh, extended families um, at this point in time are still very religious, very caught up in mm -hmm. their their thing. You know, and mm -hmm. they haven't changed, and I never pushed them into any and I've been doing this for a long time and they don't even listen to my stuff and that's okay you know uh, that's where they're at and you know at certain seasons of the year you know you have Thanksgiving or whatever you know or Christmas New Year's which I you know to me or, or Easter or whatever it is I'm not a follower of it but they are so they have family gatherings and I choose at times to join the gathering not because of it, because they don't, the religious stuff they go do in churches and whatever else, which I don't participate, but, you know, the family gathering where everybody comes for dinner and, and, and chat and so forth, you know, I still go to them. And uh, again, you know, I'm not there to tell them anything, you know, and if they ever ask me uh, something, I would just share, you know, this is how I see it. This is what I teach other people to do mm -hmm. about it. But, you know, it's up to you what you want to experience. It's, it's your choice, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not there to, to shift them or change them. It's up to them. But I did notice the, the last year or so that one of my brothers is going through some challenges in his life or uh, started questioning things and started asking my, he calls my opinion on certain things. Um, that is a little outside of the religious order and all the other stuff that, you know, he was brought up with. Mm -hmm. And he started to resonate with it. And it actually, because he hears it from other people now, in fact, it was interesting because at times he said, oh, did you know about this, 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 and this, right? Uh, I just heard this on the internet. You know, I was watching this video and whatever else, you know, and, and I laugh sometimes because in essence, it's the stuff I've been teaching for years or even further than that. 
but he heard it from somewhere else and all of a sudden it's like oh wow look could this possibly be the case you know and it just opens them up because that's uh, their choice now to go back to what you were saying regarding um, the uh, uh, the karma and so forth that is a, a human adopted idea okay something of that nature existed when there was a big uh, energetic consciousness push on creating soul balance. So the soul balance was, it was constructed in a way where if you were a victimizer in one lifetime, you had the opportunity or in, uh, you were kind of uh, guided to have the opposite and be the victim. So you can experience both sides of the polarity, okay? That lasted for quite a long time. It doesn't exist any longer. That's been erased uh, since 1986 or the end of 86 going into 87. So when, once we had that convergent, there was a soul uh, uh, modification that happened at that time, no matter if you were in a physicality or not that that balance point was not necessary anymore. The other part that was unnecessary is that we needed to learn from polarities. So at the time was, mm -hmm. the only way you can learn is to have challenges, you know, the polarity, good and bad, good mm -hmm. and bad, whatever. That's all was kind of an adopted idea that was put into it, it was played with, but it was no longer ex uh, required. So the idea that we needed to learn through pain suffering, struggling, and having the opposite no longer is required. Now, that, but that was a religious construct or was really a, 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 a spiritual construct? It was a spiritual. The, the, the pain and suffering. Because uh, I, I see that as a, a way to control people with self mm -hmm. to, be, to be in pain and service. Correct. While I don't find it a spiritual background to be to be in pain and suffering. No, it wasn't in that respect. It was more as a spiritual part. It was an extra component to experience the physicality and the emotions and stuff that would be related to that experience. Because remember, mm -hmm. this is just a video game. This is just a role <laughs> that you take on. We forget that. So when you're coming here, you don't see it as that. You say, oh, okay, if I go there and have so-called pain, it's an accentuated physical experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to possibly label it as pain. But you're going to have that accentuated experience. It's like, oh, this is enriching because in other forms, I can't have that. I can't have that same intensity in that same realism or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So when you see it from that perspective, because that's how it really is, then that was, okay, let's try this. This is an experiment. Let's create this physicality. We're going to give it the opportunity of these six, uh, you know, five sensorial uh, parts of it with, you know, the sixth as also uh, as an additional. But it can feel pain. It can have emotions. It can have ups and downs. It can play in polarity. It can have all these type of things, and it can leave in short periods of time, you know, checking out, whatever it is. And there's struggle, survival, whatever it is. So it's like this. I don't know if you ever played video games yourself. I do. Yes. <laughs> it becomes very interesting and, and playful when you have challenges because you're trying to get through, right, through, yeah, through the, the next level. level. Yes, yes, to the next level. It's, addict it's addictive also. Correct. And this, what you just said right now about the addi addictiveness, applies to the soul, which they have labeled as the soul is being harvested to come back. It becomes mm -hmm. addicted to the fact of, oh, I want to go try it again. And I want to go try it again. I want to get to the next level. I want to get to the next level. This time I'm going to make it even more challenging or I'm going to make some openings this time or whatever else. So, and it's been labeled that addictiveness to, oh, wow, well, we're being manipulated to be harvest or coming back on the planet Earth over and over again and not have the option to see anything outside of that is what part of the game 
that was constructed here. Now, of course, the souls coming here know that offhand, that that is the possibility. That is the level of the game is going to be, and it's going to be challenging. There's a possibility that you'll be, or you can choose to play on the role. Like, for example, in a video game, you can choose who you're going to be, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in there. And it's the same thing. I want to be this. I want to be the dictator. I want to be the, uh, the one that's being chased after or I want to be the beast or whatever you know it's mm -hmm. just whatever the game is and I have the possibility of being killed there or uh, not make it to the next level but I can always reset the game and start all over again and go back right so yeah. at a soul perspective Infin that's how it sees it yeah. yeah we have infinite life in this game <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> you know yes. and of course, the, game, the, the only difference with this video game and then a, um, a video game that you purchase, like a purchased one, you buy new versions of it. But in mm -hmm. this lifetime, in the video game we call Earth, or uh, the human experience and within the video game, it's always upgrading, 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 upgrading automatically, you know, because mm -hmm. each player is expanding the construct of the video game. Each experience is plugged in so that it can become more challenging, it can become more open, it can have all these opportunities that it didn't okay. have before. Okay, uh, so if we expand on this uh, metaphor of video games, um, maybe uh, the realm of souls, the domain of souls is also another video game. And there is also there the um, the uh, challenge of uh, oppositions and, and, and uh, polarities of the good and the bad and the control and, uh, and the free will and defined and I'm a kind of defined by my nature as a child I was a defined person so maybe it's, it's just another game on a, a different level yes exactly 100% because if you really look at it what is an individual soul it is part of the whole it is actually the whole consciousness, the whole existence, the whole of everything. But it goes into, some people call it a dream state. It goes into, because it's interesting because we, I, talked, uh, I talked about this many years ago, many years ago. And I said, you know, we're all looking for, a lot of people are looking for source, God, whatever you want to call it, okay? And we want to mm -hmm. return home. You know, I want to go home to being with God again or you know, with source or whatever it is. And my explanation to them, or the way I would say it is that, in fact, once you awaken, you realize that you're always still in your bed. You never, ever left home. Because everything is home. Because everything is in its existence only because you're in that field. So it's like that drop in the ocean. It's still part of the ocean because the drop is still the water that is part of the ocean. So we can't leave the ocean because everything is created in the ocean of that energy field, that consciousness, that potentiality, whatever you want to call it, all of that combined. So in essence, when you really look at the whole thing, you're right. It is another level because each level of the soul and over souls, there are just other video games. There are other aspects, each dimension, each density, each uh, uh, universe, galaxy, solar system, planet, physicalities, they're all constructs. They're all designed as part of the video game. Levels of video. So, so if, if we extrapolate on that, mm -hmm. um, if, that is, uh, if that video game that we experience on, on planet Earth can extend to soul levels that we can, uh, I can easily imagine uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, soul wars uh, like uh, we see in, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Star Wars and, and uh, the Stargate and so forth, the, the science fiction that um, sa same, same polarity. A duality exists on soul level, and I wouldn't like to have that polarity on a soul level as well. I would like to, let's say, to to keep it in this level and get free of it in the next level. Like going to the next level in in a, 
in, in the video games, when you upgrade to one level to second level, okay, you are relieved and you have you're more powerful, and and you can let go of some of of the lower levels. So what's yeah. your take? Yeah, the, the thing is with that, uh, at the most purest form of the soul itself, there is no polarity. There is no right or wrong. There is no good or bad. There's no light or dark. It's all encompass. The polarity stuff only exists once we create the next level of video game or what we call realities or we call physicalities. So like you're saying with the Star Wars and so forth, are there other beings having panels? Uh, uh, battles and so forth. Yes, there are. Much less than before because cooperation now and collaboration is, hap uh, is becoming more part of it. But even the battle on planet Earth, if you look at it for the good and good, bad, right, wrong, all of this stuff and all the fact of souls coming in, taking on various roles to play the polarity, that is localized in that respect. At a soul level, there is no battle there is collaboration, cooperation, saying, okay, we're all in it together. The oneness exists at a soul level, even though it may be you know, limited for a period of time to be able to do what it needs to do as part of its experience to play the game. But it still realizes its oneness and the fact that what we are doing, in fact, is benefiting the main source of essence that is because it's learning expanding and growing and becoming more playful and more creative more of whatever mm -hmm. you know you want to call it so yeah you're not going to find souls battling with each other but if a soul wants to facilitate its expansion it says mm -hmm. okay let's go play on this realm we'll call it earth right now mm -hmm. let's go play on that and i'm going to be the victimizer you're going to be the victim and we're going to push each other's buttons we're going to do whatever we need to do so you can learn that you're not really a victim and i'm going to learn that i don't need to play, play the victim a victimizer and we're going to uh evolve accordingly and meanwhile while we're doing all of that we're going to experience all those programs of feeling ourselves inadequate and incapable or the fact or whatever it is and that i have to be dominant so that's the other side and that uh you know i have to control people whatever it is we're gonna go play there but that's how it's observed as a play going in and 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 playing in that uh, respect so, but once you step out of the souls, you're still, you're not battling anymore. It's like, okay, great job, you know, high five, you know, like they, they say in certain parts of the world. Hey, great job. Okay, next lifetime. I'm not going to be on the next lifetime with you. I know you're going to possibly be somewhere, but I'm not going to, we're not going to interact. But, the, you know, in the following one, I'd like to take the place of where we were playing before and I, I'll be of service to you. So from a soul perspective, you know, we were talking about you know, soulmates and stuff like that in the previous yes. Uh, yes. interview. You make agreements because you've had lives together and you say, okay, this time I'm going to be your dad or I'm going to be this part and I'm going to play this role. What do you want of service? And I'm going to play those roles for you so that you could evolve in advance. And then, you know, I, there, I have a certain part that I would like to experience and expand also. Can you play this role with me? And then, of course, when you incarnate and you meet, you're going to come in and you may push buttons, you may share mm -hmm. different levels of realization, you may share consciousness or whatever it is for one another. And, and that's what happens. Like for us, I mean, you and I are connected mm -hmm. now and we're talking. Um, at some point, there was an agreement saying, you know, that's connect. You need some answers. You want to create a platform that other people can learn and grow from. Uh, you'd like to be much more uh, assistant on the planet, yourself and myself. So let's do this. Let's connect. Let's talk. Let's ask the questions that nobody asks or they ask and they don't get certain answers. Let's explore it. Let's really discover what we can really do here and get a better understanding. So that's that part of the agreement. Now, this agreement may last a little longer. We don't know where we may have other connections and whatever else. But we, yes. It goes wherever it needs to go. But that applies to anyone coming on the planet. And it doesn't have to be in this type of realm where, you know, we're sharing consciousness. It can be in the realms of whatever role somebody plays. You have a mother-in-law that, you know, is very controlling and, and, and so mm -hmm. forth. 
and she's playing okay. that role <laughs> so that you can actually empower yourself and say, well, you know, you want to play that role, that's fine, but I'm not participating. And you're not going to judge her. You're not going to hate her. You're not going to, you know, um, label that, which if you still have programs, you may, but at some point you come to the realization, hey, uh, you know, mother-in-law, I love you. Thank you for playing that role. I mean, thank you for playing whatever. At the soul level, which are communicating and saying, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Job done. I don't have to play that role with you anymore. And uh, you know, they'll play the role with whoever else, but you, you don't have to have the same relationship at that time because you don't need the same experience, right? Yeah, and that is the power of forgiveness and release. Yes, yes. So that's, that's a good question, uh, a good uh, point you made there. This whole idea of forgiveness is a useful tool to a certain level. Okay. What are we for? What does forgiveness mean? Are you forgiving somebody for doing something wrong, and that you were the victim of that wrongness? Or, for example, if you have an issue with a parent, for and just as an example, mm -hmm. and your parent was very violent or very, you know, uh, judgmental or whatever you want to call it. Now you may have certain feelings about it you may have resentment about it you may feel whatever right mm -hmm. so at some point you need you realize that 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 you're holding on to and of course like you said similarities attract um, you're going to keep bringing people to play that role for you in your life and then you get to a point and say you know something and somebody says to you you got to forgive them and of course at the ego mind at first that may be difficult because oh they were so horrible they treated me so badly and look at my life is all a mess because of it right mm -hmm. but somebody says to you you got to forgive and you got to forgive because you're that's the only way you're going to let go you're going to let go of this burden that you're carrying right yeah but people don't understand what's the meaning of forgiveness what is to be what is to forgive what's the meaning of forgiveness yes and i want you to explain that part of it because i, I i'll give you my point afterwards okay my point of forgiveness is uh, understanding, accepting, and not feeling uh, the bad feelings anymore. Mm -hmm. Let's say I, I can I can uh, easily uh, talk and uh, uh, describe the evil doings of my uh, stepfather, but I don't feel anger anymore. I don't feel victimized as a, as a small child that I was. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's my point. That's not point, but that's my um, view of being in a forgiveness place. Because I'm not really, I released, I feel, and I, I hope that it's correct, that I released the drama that, we, that I had with him. And it's no more affecting me. And that is done by forgiveness. Correct. That means that I remember, but I, I don't, I'm not angry anymore. Right. I don't pay the price anymore. Correct. So that's my point. Yeah, that's my that's my view, and that's excellent. That's the first level. Thank you. The, the first level of letting go of that. However, as much as you don't have the drama and you don't have the other aspects of it that may have played and plagued you to a certain degree, there's still a belief that, you know, my stepfather was not a very nice person, but you know, I let go of the drama that was attached to it and the energy and so forth. But are you 100% clear? Obviously, you won't be at that point until you get to the next level. The next level is appreciation mm -hmm. for the role they played. So in fact, it's not so much that I don't have any more resentment mm -hmm. for my stepfather. I now love my stepfather for being so brave so good in playing that role that I actually believed it, felt it, I created all those stories, programs, and belief systems, and now I am wiser and much more capable because of it. Then you now set a whole completely different stage. You have such love, such peace, such you're now reaching your essence by getting to that point. Step one, then step two. Okay. My, my, my challenge 
is uh, I released my personal drama with him, but I did not release uh, my uh, my view of the other dramas that were around us, that the family dramas and the other members of the family that were collected, co uh, uh, not collected, associated with the drama. So I feel like I did my part uh, and I'm waiting for the other people on, 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 on the drama to release and let go. And maybe it will be another lifetime. I don't know. Well, I would say not needing to be another lifetime. So in essence, you let go of your drama and so forth. Now, imagine this. You get to the point, you appreciate everybody's drama. Look it, mm -hmm. beautiful. Everybody's playing this role, fantastic. <laughs> but what you're gonna do now is when you go visit the family, when you're engaged with them in the family, I've had to do this personally myself, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about also from experience here. I'm not just theorizing or sharing something of a higher conscious without experiencing. And this is what the beauty about the human experience is all about. You get to play with it yourself. <laughs> so here you are. So good in the bed. Yeah, it's actually amazing after a while. I mean, at first it starts off with the mind going, oh no, I don't want to do that. But, uh, but if you show up in your family and they're having their drama and you just sit and observe, you have no judgment. You are not seeing them right, wrong, good, bad. You're not seeing them that, oh, look at them. They're all engaged in drama, whatever it is. Just watch. And you're in so peaceful and just watch. Okay? See it okay. now as the video game that's playing in front of you. You're now stepping back. You have the control, but you're not going to control. You're going to just watch it. Oh, look who's doing that. Who's doing this and who's that. That happens for a while. And things start to change. I did this with myself. My family's heavy into drama and all that stuff. And my father was king in that respect. Well, my mother was too, but and my father just brought it to the next level. They're both no longer on the planet, but what I got, regardless. But everybody else, you know, in the family, uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters, whatever, you know, and very families and whatever else. So here they are, they get together, they're having the family get togethers. And there's all this drama, who's doing this, who's doing that, who did that, who did that, you know, and on, going on and on and on. You know, and there was a period of time, I would avoid going to it because I just didn't want to participate, okay? But then I came to the realization, you know something, everybody else experiences that, and that's not the advice I want to give anybody. I'd really, I have to figure this out. I want to really experience this. I'm going to go in as the observer. Totally. No judgment, no nothing. So I go there. And I'm sitting there at the table with everybody going on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And I go, wow, this is interesting. Look at that. Wow. Hmm. No judgment, which took a little bit of training to do because I had to really mm -hmm. shut the ego mind's idea of perception. It's like, Oh, look at that. Well, why are you doing that? You know, and, the, and I go, no, 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 no. We're just observing here. This I'm having a conversation in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm observing, and I'm observing, and I'm observing, and I'm observing. And I notice that my energy, because it was engaged, was kind of like there's a room that's very dim lit. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is an analogy to look at. The room is very dim lit, and there's a lot of activity going in there, but you can't see all the activity that's going on in the dim lit room. You walk in and you, you have a little bit of a light, but you're not illuminating. But as you start to observe, your light gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And now the activity in the room becomes more exposed. But it's not like you're only seeing it, they're seeing it themselves. This is very, you, you need to do this experiment, okay? Okay. So I see them, no judgmental, just observing. My energy and light starts to get brighter and brighter. 
And they start realizing that they're getting caught up in this drama and that they're feeding each other on the drama. And they notice that they're starting to observe themselves. I didn't say a word. I said nothing. I'm just observing. They're realizing it themselves because what happens is you're creating a certain energy and a certain brightness that they can actually see it. And they, their conversation starts to shift and tune down. And after a little while, the drama wow. starts to get so mellow that it starts to calm down. And eventually, they almost pay attention to you and say, well, what do you feel about this, all of this? And I go, well, it's really humorous. I'm, I'm really observing all of this. And it's, it's amazing how we can all get engaged. We, I said, not how you guys can get engaged. How we mm -hmm. can really get engaged. And I was just, at this time, I was just really wanting to observe rather than getting engaged. And it was really interesting what I was seeing. And I think you guys are seeing that too. And I go, yeah. I, you know, we, we play with a lot of drama, you know? And I must say, after that, each and every time that I went there, the time span was shorter and shorter where they go on from drama to non-drama. And now I notice after years, and it doesn't have to be years, that it almost doesn't even start. It's almost like they already know you're going to show up and that it's going to change anyway. So they don't even get engaged. You walk there and they're already very civil with each other. That's how you play a role in it, you know, in, in that respect. And I found that with my own experiment that that's how it works. And I've, I've taught this to others that have come to my retreats and events and whatever else. And a lot of them have experimented and they've noticed the same thing. Now, if you have particular individuals that normally you have the most challenging interactions with, um, they're the ones that actually seem like they change when they're communicating with you. Because I used to see it with my own personal experience. We say with my father, he was very um, intense person. Let's put it this way. <laughs> and I know, and I know, with the interaction with everybody, interactions with everybody, it was always intense. But it came to the point where I did not engage in that intensity. But I just observed him. You know, and I would still be my calm self. I would not get engaged, but, but I didn't feel like I was suppressing. I just didn't feel triggered, right? It was interesting because he could be in the middle of having negative interactions or what you can call really accentuated, colorful interactions. And then he would turn to me and he, all of a sudden he'll start communicating with me and that intensity would be almost non-existent. The rules that he expected from other interactors were very different with me to the fact that there was hardly any rules. Mm -hmm. One example. It was Christmas time. I had not seen or talked to my father in a few months. It's not something I do normally. And we've mm -hmm. kind of agreed that, you know, on a soul level that we didn't need to always interact. My brothers have a different rule with, my father has a different rule for my brother. They have to call him twice a week. Twice a week. Every week. Don't you dare miss or else you're really going to get shit. <laughs> so they show up. And of course, you know, I arrived a little later than they did. And uh, so my father's giving them shit for missing one day in the week for contacting. All right? Mm -hmm. And they're getting reprimanded by it. I walk in and I have not seen or talked to him in a few months. Mm -hmm. Okay. Since Christmas and it was Easter, you know, there are a few months between there. And my father just said, Oh, hi, hi. How you doing? I haven't talked to you in a while, whatever it is. And I'm, eh, you know, doing okay. You know, whatever. We had a little chit chat. My brother, one of my brothers is, is watching all of this. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, just curiosity, when was the last time you talked to dad? I said, well, it was at Christmas time. And he's going, you haven't talked to him, you haven't seen him since Christmas time, and he's so nice to you? And I missed <laughs> one day this week and he's giving me shit and he's blasting me away? I said, yeah, because I don't 
I don't need the drama. I don't play in the drama. I don't activate that part of it because it's not part of my experience that I need. Hmm. And have I had it before? Yes, many years ago, absolutely. But I'm no longer there, right? And I was like, wow, okay, you know, and then, so this is kind of how it works for all of us. So if you go in as the observer and you notice the triggers, this is what I tell people all the time. And I teach this. Don't pay attention or focus on what somebody does or says or plays with you ever. Because that is a huge distraction and it is the engaged of victim victimizer. So if somebody pisses you off, I'm going to give you an example. Somebody pisses you off. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, look at what they did, or if they did some wrongdoing from a perspective on a collective idea that they did a wrongdoing to you, mm -hmm. instead of saying, look at what they did wrong, or judging them or getting upset about it or wanting to have revenge or anything of that nature, you take the focus about the, away from what they just did or said or whatever happened and you ask yourself, why am I upset? And if your ego mind says, because they did such and such, you will say, yes, they did such and such, but why does that actually upset me? And you continue asking the question until you get to the core of your story or your belief that you adopted. That's how you make progress to look at your programs mm -hmm. and start clearing it. The same thing with the well, forgiveness. You know, you may forgive dad for playing that role, but the next level is yes, you can thank them for the role. Then you ask yourself, what really bothered me about that role? What was the issue with that role that was so challenging for me? That's okay. what I want to understand. Okay. One of, let's say, my major programs in life, patterns of uh, that I want to be light. <laughs> and, uh, and when there is any kind of sign of, of aggression or, or dislike towards me gets me, gets me very defensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I understand uh, the historical reasons and the patterns that, uh, that, that triggers me and so forth. But yet, I see it as a kind of a stream that stream of behaviors of of behavioral patterns that governs my 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 whole uh, interaction theme with other people and and looking at this and let's say being reflective and seeing what well, why this is now i can see that it happens uh, this behavior this pattern at real time and i know how how I, I react with that, but yet I'm still engaging in this pattern. I did not release it yet. Mm -hmm. And I did not release it because I didn't have, or I didn't find an alternative yet. Because I care so much to be liked mm -hmm. okay, and okay. loved. And I believe that once I will release this, this craving to be liked and like like a small child, helpless child, I will be able to change my behavior toward others. And this is self-reflective of what are my needs from this interaction. And and this inter this kind of perspective on the interaction is opposite of empowering me and disempowers me. Yet it it's still it still governs my my behavior. The other thing you can notice too is 
how much freedom because of that program do you actually have to make the choices you would prefer to make? For example, with the strong need to be liked, how many things you do that you would prefer not to do? How many things you don't do that you would like to do because you don't want to be un, un, unliked? For example, you may want to say something, you may want to experience something, but it'd be outside of what is believed as acceptable. And because of that, and for you not to be liked, is so important that you choose to not do that. So your free will gets more limited because mm -hmm. you can't make all the choices you really want to. Because if I do, then I have the possibility of being outcasted not liked, uh, mm -hmm. judged, or anything of that nature. So you could see how mm -hmm. one thing that small could heavily, heavily taint or shape or mm -hmm. limit all of the above, actually, your reality. So yes. the question I ask you is, what is so important to you about being liked? What does that represent to you? I, I believe that the, on the bottom line, mm -hmm. um, because I was an ab abandoned child, mm -hmm. I was always trying to please others so they will not abandon me. Correct. So by pleasing people, have you felt less abandoned because of it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay. Okay. And even if your best effort, the times that you were still abandoned, even with your best effort, mm. as much as you did everything to be liked, you still got abandoned. How did that make you feel? Um, victimized. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Victimized. Uh, and uh, not good enough. Okay. So let's go back to, and I, I won't do a whole clearing process on the call here because I, I don't have all that much time left, but um, I, I have somebody that's coming over uh, for a little project here, so I have to uh, trim it down a bit. Um, so in asking the question at this point in time, Let's see how I can refrain, uh, rephrase that so it's uh, easy. Okay, I'll just do it with, with that. Let's look back at a time when you felt that for some reason you weren't liked and that's why you were abandoned. Let's go back to that time. Let's see yourself mm -hmm. in that time where you felt that for the first time, the most powerful way. I, be, I don't have the uh, remembrance of, of uh, a scene. Mm -hmm. I was two years old. Mm -hmm. I have a recollection of the feelings. Okay, so let's go into the feelings. Okay. What was happening in the feelings? What were you feeling at that point in time? That uh, I can't survive. I cannot survive alone. Okay. Absolutely helpless. Okay. And how did you survive? My, uh, I trusted my brother to take care of me. Mm -hmm. So you survived? Yes. Okay. Uh, but, but that was for one evening. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> so what happened after that evening? That was a drama. That was a lifetime drama. Okay. So I feel yeah, like you're, my, you're my, still, my, my, father, my father is going for a way and, and he will never, never come back. And... Okay. So in essence, let's tap into it. Your father choosing to leave. Okay. So let's ask your father. So tune in, because you can tune in from a hard level. Ask your father, why was he leaving? 
because he was a uh, night teaching in a remote con- in a remote city mm-hmm. and it was a uh, four hours drive each way mm-hmm. and and he had to uh, uh to provide for us correct so <laughs> that he was going out to do something to provide for you so he in fact he was looking after you weren't it wasn't he mm-hmm. yes yes Okay, but then you adopted the idea that your dad was abandoning you, wasn't, wasn't that yeah. what your adopted idea? Okay, yes. so ask yourself, why are you feeling abandoned? What's that all about? Sorry for myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and demanding, demanding uh, attention. Correct. So why was it so important for you to have attention? What did that represent to you? Acknowledgement. Mm-hmm. And what did it we have to acknowledge? What did we have to acknowledge? That, that, uh, that I'm loved before. And I think that, uh, that I exist because I'm was most of the time quite neglected and abandoned by, by everybody. Okay. Uh, so and when I made drama, I, I had uh, attention. <laughs> I had <some> attention. <laughs> okay. So let's ask yourself, regardless of what was happening, did you exist? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, regardless about the drama or not that you were making, were people aware that you existed, that you were there in their lives and that they were playing a role in your life? Yes, it was only three, me, my father and my brother. Mm-hmm. That was the family at that time. Right. And while, while your father was away for four hours, uh, or away for a period because it was too much to, to travel. For the night. For the night. For the night. Who was there to, to look after you? My brother. And he was quite abusive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so ask your brother right now, why is he being abusive at that time? He, he was a child. He... Okay, you froze. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, and, and he, he was seven, I was uh, two, and he was playing with me. Mm-hmm. And I was a toy for him. Right. Right. No, no, so uh, he, he was he was nine. He was nine, and I was two. Okay. So there was seven years. So mm-hmm. as far as is concerned, you were his playmate, and yes. his you know, and so forth. And, but, yes, and he, he enjoyed he enjoyed teasing me and and, and abusing me. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he was quite, uh, I would say, uh, in, innovative. <laughs> okay. So at that point in time, you who made the decision that that was abusive and that you were not being attention? Because uh, here's your brother. Even though he's playing whatever he's playing, he's paying a lot of attention to you, isn't he? Yeah. 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 So why would you get the idea that uh, I don't, I'm not getting attention or that, you know, I've been abandoned when realistically, dad was there at times and then there was your brother there the other times and uh so you still had uh you still had interaction going on so why did you adopt that whole idea what was that all about um because um i think all along my childhood Mm -hmm. um i was kind of um flipped among among the parents every once in a week uh my father um left me with my mom's place mm-hmm. and i felt like he was abandoning me mm-hmm. and and the end of the weekend when i returned uh, to my father's place i felt like i was abandoned by my mom so every week i felt like very intense separations twice a week. Mm-hmm. So if you, yeah. you, you saw it that way because of your perspective. Yeah, that's, my, that's, that's my perspective now as a grown-up. Right. But as okay. a child, I was always separated. 
okay. always uh, torn away from from the immediate and important, let's say, uh, adult next to me. Okay, so let's ask this way. If you were to look at it from that perspective as a child saying, wow, look, I get more direct attention with each individual parent taking turns to, to pay attention to me rather than having both of them ignore me because they're too busy with their lives or in each other. But now you're going from one house, you get the experience of one house with one parent. Then you go to another house, you have another parent and you get to go back and forth. Wow, I get to play with both and I get the attention of both and the attention is different, mm -hmm. but not only the attention, the experience of different. If you apply that to, to that observation, how would you feel? Uh, I would feel, feel that uh, that was uh, uh, a very important lesson uh, as a child um, uh, to learn to be uh, uh, resilient mm -hmm. and uh, uh, independent mm -hmm. and uh, from very uh, young age, I uh, realized um, that uh, I'm unique and uh, I belong nowhere. Mm -hmm. I belong not here, no, something. So there's no real, real home. It, uh, kind of, I, I'm, I want to be uh, associated and liked by the people, by this person or that person. Mm -hmm. There's no real home. There's no permanent, permanent uh, base home. Uh, and I look at the other mo models of families around me. I said, "Wow, I want this. I want this. Uh, let's say uh, opt optimized family. This is this will be uh, the best life ever. This uh, this family and so forth." I felt like that was a, um, a fantasy. Mm -hmm. That if you have a base of living, of of a uh, uh, strong base that um, of strength, mm -hmm. um, that will that will make me strong. And I always felt felt weak. Okay, so let me ask I you a was, question. I was looking for I was looking for for base and and. And I feel like, like, like a, a, a sea wave going from here to there, back and forth, always departing. I didn't see the bonding, the part of the bonding because there's so much engaging in the departing. Mm -hmm. okay? I, I, could be, I could look at the, okay, I could be very happy of, let's say, engaging with my mom instead of departing from, from my dad and, and back forth and, and the other way back. But I was so much engaged in, in the departing part and not on the, on the welcome part. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think that that was because of, I felt myself weak. I was looking for someone to support me always. Right. But were you actually ever weak? Yes. Physically, I was always uh, thin uh, and small uh, and the beaten child. <laughs> 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 that was my perception. Okay, that was your perception, but now with the understanding you have and seeing other people that were thin, you know, small, whatever you want to call it, uh, achieve amazing things of whatever they wanted to achieve, do you still want to hold on to that whole idea? No, no. I don't. And, and I, But I believe that uh, one of the added values from, from this way of, of being brought up is that I'm very compassionate. Mm -hmm. Sometimes too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, the compassion, compassion is interesting because there's two types of compassion. There's a compassion where you feel bad for people, for their situation, circumstances, or whatever's happening to them. And that's a very disempowering and very low vibration. Then there's a compassion of understanding where they're at and what they're dealing with and whatever is going. And then you, you're supportive on, with the fact that they can actually transcend all of that and they don't actually have to stay in that limited state. So mm -hmm. most people understand the compassion of feeling bad for people. 
where the true compassion is understanding that this could be challenging for them, but they have created such an opportunity for advancement and growth that is there anything I can assess, assist you to open your eyes to see how beautiful this is for you mm -hmm. and what you can do? There's two different, very different power that come with it because one is very empowering, which is basically seeing the, the, where they're at. The same thing with yourself. So it's just an adjustment on seeing that everybody's on their own personal experience. Everyone is learning from it and everybody has the same capacity uh, and power to be able to shift any part of it. So mm -hmm. to bring back to what you were saying there, do you have a friend or someone that you knew growing up that had the ideal family that you yes. want? Okay. Yes. Yes. And, and I talked to him. Mm -hmm. He was my, my, uh, my brother's best friend. Mm -hmm. and, and I adored his mom as the ultimate mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, now he's almost 60 and, and I talked to him and, and he told me, you know, they had their own issues. <laughs> they, they have the sibling uh, rivalry and they have sick mother at home, sick uh, uh, grandmother at home. And there were uh, problems of uh, providing and, and, and income and they had their own issues. Mm -hmm. But for me as a kid, they were the ultimate family. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. But even if you asked, if you if you asked him, did he find himself in a situation with more opportunity to self empower with what so called ideal situation or uh, family situation or not? I don't understand the question. Okay, so if you had to ask him right now, from a soul perspective, based on on your experience with so called ideal family. Did you feel that you were more self-empowered and uh, uh, being in that experience rather than having uh, no foundation? He or me? You're asking him. Okay. To, uh, you're asking him from a soul perspective. Was he empowered? Mm -hmm. I believe he, he, he was uh, 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 very empowered and he was very loved and nurtured as a child. Mm -hmm. which I was not as much, and that's why I envied so much. Okay. Now, when you're asking his soul, do you, does he feel that in some way he had the advantage over you? No, not, not at, at all. all. Not, not, at all. At, not at all. Okay. And, and I feel that uh, in some way uh, I am spiritually much stronger than he is. Correct. Correct. Because you have to find your own foundation mm -hmm. where he had the support holding him up. It, mm -hmm. This is what happens too. And this is why when we come enter the video game or we call it our planetary, at times we put ourselves in such a disadvantage, what looks like a disadvantaged position so that we can actually flourish and, and self-empower within it where, you know, if you, if you have, because I've worked with many, many, many people over the years. Uh, as uh, you know, a consultant and so forth, helping them through their life. And I found that the ones that have experienced the most amount of support from a family dynamic tend to have less self-strength. They, they create more reliance on their environment. And as soon as their environment starts to fall apart, they fall apart. For example, I'll give you one example of a, a real instant. There was this one gentleman. He was supported by his family tremendously. And mm -hmm. uh, to the point where he found himself that without the family, he didn't feel that he could actually do as much. Then he got married and he was in a relationship and the relationship was not the same nurturing and so forth. But it was close, mm -hmm. except the partner, the wife at the time, decided that she wanted something different and left him. They separated. Mm -hmm. His world crashed to the point where he was like a, a meltdown because in essence, he felt that he was now abandoned. He couldn't find his own grounding because 
in the family dynamics when he was being raised, the family supported him. Then when he got married, because he went from marriage to, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, from f being with the family to marriage, he, mm -hmm. his wife was supporting him. And then when the life, wife left, the family wasn't even su sustainable enough to support him. And then he had to crash and he found that he had no foundation, self-governed foundation for himself. He didn't know who he was without all the mm -hmm. support mechanisms that were in there. So, I mean, was he in a disadvantage? In one way, yes and no. But in, in the other way, no, sorry. But in essence, that was a great experience for him because I helped mm -hmm. him find his self. And when he found himself, he now had no reliance for anyone, but he was open to play with anyone. Like he was okay with the family or in another relationship without the fear of abandonment, without the fear of, you know, I'm going to be hurt. My, you know, I'm going to have my heart uh, hurt or whatever, mm -hmm. or my feelings or whatever you want to call it, because somebody's there. And I mean, the role was great because in essence, for him, he did everything possible for his wife mm -hmm. at the time to make sure she didn't leave. But she left. And that was even much more powerful, devastating, because it's like, oh, I did everything I could to be there for you. And now you're not here for me, you know, type of thing. But that was the whole mm -hmm. scenario because at a soul level, he had to kind of find his own grounding. So in your case, you started fairly early. You started mm -hmm. with all this other part to discover yourself. Now, with the whole idea that, you know, I need to be liked was an idea that you have adopted at the time because you felt like if people don't like me, they're not around me, then I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, or I'm not this. Mm -hmm. But in fact, yes. that was just an adopted idea. How much of it is actually mm -hmm. true? Is the question I ask you. How much of it is true? It's not true. It's, it's a childhood program. Yes. So how does that still serve you now? It's not, but I don't, I, I, I don't know how to replace it. Okay. Don't replace it. Just let it go. So let's let it go. Okay. I choose to release the whole concept, the whole idea, the perception and so forth, that I need to be liked, I need to be accepted, that I need to have people support me, that I need to have people come in as part of my life to give worth to my life, to make it valuable for me to even be here. I relinquish all, I release it, I thank yeah, you for I, serving I, me. When, when you say that, uh -huh. I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm addicted. I'm addicted to being liked. Okay. So I, I it's like, uh, and, and, and uh, I think it's, it's like the addiction of, of, um, um, of a drama actor mm -hmm. the, in, in, in the theater. Mm -hmm. It needs the applaud of, of, of the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. It feeds me. It feeds my ego. Correct. Okay. So now you got to ask yourself, how does it feel to be always in lack of that and always wanting that to be there to uplift you at an at a ego level? How does that feel? To always only get it temporarily, get it occasionally, and always mm -hmm. wanting to crave it all the time. How does it's, that feel? It's... it's uh... It's an infinite chase. Correct. Correct. So infinite now chase. you ask yourself, ego mind, do you still need this? Or are you ready to let this go? This okay. Chase. I would say, I don't need it, but I want it. Why do you want it? <laughs> ask enjoy. your ego mind, why do you want I, it? I, I enjoy it. Okay. I enjoy it so great. I, 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 I get the appreciation and uh, I get attention. Okay. And, people, uh, and when you don't have it, do you enjoy it also? Yes. I also enjoy myself, uh, kind of being with myself and doing my own stuff. My, my I would say, uh, internal, uh, internal life, inner life is very rich. Mm -hmm. And I can I can engage myself for for weeks alone, mm -hmm. but I like people as well. 
<laughs> okay. I like humans around as well. Okay. So at this point in time, are, do you still find it valuable and you still want to hold on to both sides? I, I have my inner connection and I have my outer connection. Yes, I, I, I wish to transform the need to want. Okay. The need to be liked, to want to be liked, and release if you if don't want. Because there are places, let's say workplaces, and, and I, I, was in the, I was serving in the uh, Israeli Navy as well. You can't be liked by everyone all the time. Mm -hmm. It's impossible, okay? And uh, sometimes I was uh, extremely, uh, let's say, uh, euphoric, and mm -hmm. sometimes I was very, uh, let's say, uh, uh, depressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was correlation with the, let's say, likeness that I felt. Mm -hmm. But uh, I believe that as human being with my ego, I, um, I developed all kinds of mechanisms how to uh, get connected and uh, assist and, and be of value and service to other people. And that's how I get to be liked. And, and I feel that on a spiritual level, that's a service that I want to, to uh, retain. Mm -hmm. So how about being of service without any part of being liked or not liked? Just being of service because that's what you want to be. You want to share that part. You be of service, but you're not concerned about who likes you, who doesn't like you. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing that... Will that feel free to you or free? Yes, absol yes absolutely. Okay, so let's absolutely. do that. Let's do that. So let's agree, if you feel comfortable with that, agree that I don't need to be liked or unliked, but I'm just going to be of service. I'm going to be of service and let whoever wants to like me or not like me just be. And in yes. fact, by doing that... That's much better. That's absolutely. much better. Yes, and then and the question see. comes up, do you think you'll be liked more when you're not looking to be liked and you're actually being yourself of service? Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's kind of, and it's also empowering. Correct. It's empowering, and I feel the empower, the, the, the wave of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you choose that as your new reality from this moment on. Yes. Yes, and and um, currently I, I've uh, I'm in a new uh, uh, job, uh, and uh, I'm kind of uh, took a very senior uh, uh, technical position, mm -hmm. and I'm always striving to um, prove my worthiness as, as a senior uh, technical person, role or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, in my previous role, this, this uh, strive to, uh, to prove myself mm -hmm. okay, and, and fear of not being good enough uh, manifested. I pushed myself too far too fast to the place that I was not good enough. Mm. Okay. But I was liked, very liked on, on the previous place. But now, in this place, I feel like, okay, I, uh, my sense of, uh, of observer, my ability to observe the drama improved in the last year or six months to say, well, it's only a passing drama mm -hmm. and I can do it and I can prove it. And uh, I'm much 
become more relaxed with this urge to prove, prove my worthiness. Okay, so let's go one step further with that. See yourself from now on at work, just being you. Use your skills, use mm -hmm. your capacity to expand your skills, not to prove anything, not to be liked, just because that's what you do. You are good at what you do. Just do it. You're not going to even put one inch, uh, one drop of focus on any aspect of trying to prove anything. You're just doing yourself. So if you had to envision yourself right now at work, doing mm -hmm. what you do best, and just being yourself with everybody around you, if we go into that right now and see yourself there, how do you feel, first of all? I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm not ready to make that committed yet. Well, I'm, 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 very ask. I'm very addicted to this, to this uh, prove myself and being on a race. And I wish to, to release this race, mm -hmm. this chase. Okay. I have to know everything all time okay and it's impossible it's it's impossible and it's not human to to know all the technical levels of all, all the time everywhere correct so i mean if you're going to use it as a tool to advance and learn more about it so you can do your skills much more that's okay but you can do that with ease yes. without going to push yourself because let me ask you right now, when you're pushing yourself, aren't you actually fighting yourself? And, and don't you find it more stressful? Don't you find it more? Yeah, I, fi I find this stress as motivator. Okay. Sometimes this is a good motivator and sometimes it's a harmful, harmful mot motivator. So ask your body right now. Stress, is it actually beneficial for you? Let's feel it in your body body is the stress of any form motivator or non-motivator is it actually beneficial for you do you thrive off it no not at all no, absolutely not absolutely, absolutely not, not. so I, now that's ask your mind mind do you actually enjoy stress yes absolutely what do you get out of stress uh, I, get so adrenaline. I get that? adrenaline i i get adrenaline rush Okay. I get, I get motivation. I get long, long hours of concentration. Um, Correct. Now, let's ask, are you dependent on the body for adrenaline? Yes, of course. Okay. The, the so, body has produced the adrenaline. Okay. So let's ask the uh, adrenal glands right now. Adrenal glands, are you exhausted? Not really. Not really? Not really. Okay. Do you... and, and, and saying that, I'm humbly not asking for any uh, uh, lesson or uh, uh, about uh, my adrenal glands. Thank mm -hmm. you. I, I, I'm very grateful for my adrenal glands. I appreciate them and uh, I, I adore them and uh, uh, admire the service for us as a body, as in a person. Okay. Meanwhile, we're now gonna ask the body, how do you feel about having all of that adrenaline running through you? We enjoy it. <laughs> we enjoy it and, and it's kind of give us a rush in power, empowerment rush mm -hmm. for ideas, ideas and focus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So at least now you have an understanding where all of this is coming. So at some point, mm -hmm. if you decide together, mind, body, and soul, that you're mm -hmm. done with this, because we haven't even asked your soul. So let's ask your higher self, soul. Soul, do you like this way of operating? Mm, it's serving. It's, it's just a vehicle. It's, it's, Not, not for good and not for bad. It's impartial. 
about it. Okay, so, so it's not, you, it's a, the, the, soul, the soul is, the lesson was learned, the experience was experienced. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's... Do you still it's, want it's, it? It's no, it's no, it's no, it has no um, extended value anymore. Right, okay. But, 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 uh, but uh, we, the souls, uh, has value and experience in the work in the workforce and in the uh, technology uh, um, domain. Let's say that that they serve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is software. Okay, software. Okay, mm -hmm. so at this point in time is the mind body and soul all in alignment with this uh stress and this adrenaline rush and this uh trying to please the body yes the mind not the soul impartial okay so now the, the decision you make is do i stay with this do I start trimming it or do I just abandon the whole thing and try something completely different as an experience? I, I want to trim it. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, my, my value shines. Mm -hmm. My value as a person rather than a professional shines. Okay. And, peop and people appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at least you have a more of a clear idea of, and then you have the freedom now to trim it as much as you want and to actually turn it off completely where you can go in and just experience uh, mm -hmm. the whole life. Yes. Of, without, without it. Yes. Yes. Because Thank you. Adrenaline sometimes uh, at times served, and I, I experience it myself. You know, and if I have to get a job done, uh, I use it. Um, I find that at times with that, you have a little bit more creativity. But when you are more calmer, I find the creativity goes even further because then you actually go outside of the learning, outside of the box, outside of what everybody else has been teaching, you know. So mm -hmm. now you can design something even more advanced because I mean I was a mechanical engineer for a long time 23 years actually um, while I was doing this too and as part of that experience in I trained myself if you want to call it that to think outside the box and I did my best not under stress stress created sometimes a sense of urgency and, and put some things together quicker mm -hmm. But the true creativity and imagination was in the calmness, in the stillness, in the not trying to prove anything. I was going in as like, okay, I choose to come up with something that would serve the purpose that goes outside of anything that we've already invented or come up with. And if somebody mm -hmm. shared it at some point and it has not been developed, I'd like to access it. And and then I just allowed the mind to wander in it, looking at it and saying, well, I tried this, if I tried that or whatever. And we come up with some amazing designs, amazing concepts, mm -hmm. amazing, you know, technology feat uh, in doing things that other people weren't doing. And uh, so at that point, I was not using adrenaline. Adrenaline was when something had to be done by a certain time mm -hmm. and you had to rely on your old way of learning or whatever it was. But the most creative came in non-adrenaline stress uh, points, not the fight and flight thing coming yeah. in. I see, I see my greatest uh, achievements, uh, professional and non-professional, were while being playful as a child. Correct. Perfect. Engaging in a playful, uh, non-stressful, uh, inquisitive, uh, approach to to the uh, to the goal or to the assignment or whatever, mm -hmm. and I try to uh, 
whenever I remember to, to engage this approach of being inquisitive and playful and childlike with, with the assignments. Exactly. And it works. It works. Yes, absolutely. So this is the balance point you're going to play with. How much do I want to be in that creative, playful part? My, my model is Richard Feynman. What and was that again? Sorry? Richard Feynman, Dick okay. Feynman. Mm -hmm. He was a Nobel, he is a, he is a physicist, he is a Nobel laureate, mm -hmm. and he was, he was participate, he was the youngest participant in the Manhattan Project, and you can, there were, there was uh, some films and, and books that uh, if you, in the physics arena, he, he is, he's known. Right, right. And he okay. was, and he was, he was known for being a child, childlike, playful person. Excellent. Yes, and uh, how are we with the time? I'm, I'm way past my time, so um, it's uh, I need to really go. So, in essence, um, it was great uh, for today. I'm, to... I'm I'm very grateful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, uh, we'll have to organize another time uh, if we want to go further. I I have a little bit of a timeline that I have to deal with that showed up yesterday that I need to address. So um, we'll, we'll connect on that. But I, I just, is there anything in closing you want to say before I stop the recording? Uh, I would like to first express my gratitude. And, and uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing uh, that uh, um, the question I ask you about uh, the prison planet, uh, you returned to me, but I didn't expect, uh, 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 received your, your point, your, your, your view upon. Okay. Okay. So I agree with you. Uh, I think you had said that, are, are we actually living on a prison planet? And if that is the case, as who are the prisoners? We are the prisoners? Well, my question is, uh, are we in a prison planet, first of all? What do you feel about that? Yes, partially yes. Okay. Because, and, mm -hmm. but, 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 that's, but that's your view. Your, your view that we are in a prison planet, but my view is also that we are in, so we are in, in agreement. Well, we're but, not really, because in a way it's two parts to that. We've created a planet that represents what we can call a prison planet, but in fact, there is no prison planet because we have the exit point at any point in time. Not only do we have okay. the exit point, we have the capacity to actually navigate within it. Doesn't matter what structures are in place, you can change any part of it. The thing is, if we want to play victim, then yes, we're in a prison planet because as a victim, you feel that uh, at this point in time, someone else has the key to your mm -hmm. prison, to your uh, choice of your freedom and, and so forth. We have created what resembles a prison planet in a way to be able to really empower ourselves in it. When somebody asks me that question, you know, that's why I always ask you, mm -hmm. but I've never seen it as a prison planet as per se how people would perceive it that you're here, you're in prison, you can't until you, your time is up. But it may look that way to a certain degree, but in fact, every creation is a creation, every playground is a playground, every uh, uh, mm -hmm. thing that we've created, we have in and out, we have full uh, control of how we want to navigate. Now, if we relinquish that as part of the experimental experience of choosing there, mm -hmm. because like I said, in the soul level, if you want to come in and you want to, exp because look at the different experiences of uh, prison that you can have. You can be in, uh, in, in a country that is completely dominated by the control structure and say, well, that's one level of prison. You go to another part of the world and they're, they're more relaxed about certain things, but you mm -hmm. still don't have to, you're another level of prison. So you have maximum prison, you have the a little lighter prison, and then you mm -hmm. have the very freedom, and then you actually have freedom altogether, depending where you're, you're, you want to play with. Mm -hmm. 
So at a soul, you say, okay, I want to go play with this one because this is where I can flourish and have my challenges and experience and do what I have not done in my previous lives and so forth. The fact is, as a soul, you have a, the choice to come on this planet or go on another planet, like we were talking about before. You feel that mm -hmm. you're addicted to drama, to anxiety, to mm -hmm. being stressed, to adrenaline rush, and whatever else, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a choice. You have a freedom mm -hmm. to, to have that experience, right? It's the same thing. Do I want to be, um, how can I say, feeling that in one way that planet Earth is the only choice I have. I can come out and play here all the time, and I want to go there to that level of drama, and then I'm going to choose what level of drama I want to have. It. That's what it is. Yeah. But it's, I, we always have the freedom if I go to this planet or not this planet, or I choose a form or I don't choose a form, or I just become a guide or I don't want to be a guide. You know, I can be any part of it. You have that freedom. But planet Earth, if you really look at it, as much as it you know, resembles a form of prison planet, and there are some you know, authorities, self-dictated authorities, and we've given the power for those self-dictated authorities, that we are here, you know, we come here and we have that instruction, that structure in, but we actually have the total freedom of how we want to participate or not in any part of it and how long we stay and don't stay and whatever we want to do and what form we want to take on and what, whatever, you know, so yes. that brings it back and saying, are we actually living in a prince planet? No, but that, uh, I I I I um I agree with you, but that's when uh, the awakened soul is aware of its choices. But, uh, let's But if, as let's say, um, uh, a died soul is going for the review, and is not aware of its choices. And it's streaming along with uh, with its past life, okay. And uh, afterward, it's follow its uh, its a, a previous life uh, uh, dictation and and uh, I would say programming. Mm -hmm. And let's say if it was religious or whatever, and it goes on and gone as on. And I believe that there are some non. Uh, uh, that are entities which are not uh, have do, do not have souls that uh, that live uh, let's say nourish themselves feed on the negative emotions that we with the souls produce correct and and, and they uh, make the best effort to keep to keep to keep us and uh, let's say um, the souls, and uh, uh, I would say uh, manipulate and deceive us to stay and serve and to play in this uh, in this game in order to produce negative emotions. Correct. That's Until how, that's we realize how that we don't want to be participating with that anymore, and then we don't, and then they stop existing. Yes. They merge. No, they, then they exist with someone else. Let's say. I feel I'm not angry with them because they are part of creation mm -hmm. and they are serving something. And I'm not angry uh, or resentful about these beings because every uh, being in a creation has a service. Correct. Now, what happens when there's nobody else to attach to or to feed off because we're no longer playing the that particular role like for example the anger resentment all that stuff if that lower energy is no longer being emitted because everybody's kind of awakened then what happens to the ones that actually thrive on that they will transform to something else correct so they're here until we are done it's our like part. it's like it's like virus mm -hmm. when when the body changes the virus changes as well Yes, but also the virus feeds off a, a certain condition, and if the condition is no longer there, the virus can't thrive. Yes, but uh, the, the the virus is dormant, mm -hmm. 
and if and if conditions comes let's say uh, uh, it it is uh, revived and changed to fit a new it's the most adaptive uh, uh, entity is the, the virus correct but you want to just look at it uh, even a virus itself is a software program so yes. you being in software and you turn around and say you know this particular component of this software this particular set of instructions and the role that it plays is no longer required in this particular uh, uh, requirement that we're we are or this environment that we're trying to create mm -hmm. here so you take it out of the equation it's like a video game you got mm -hmm. a video game you have a particular villain and eh, you know i'm not interested in having this villain anymore i'm going to take that out of the uh, software program yes. so it's not there anymore and yes. that's what happens when once we've gotten to a point of evolution where you no longer require that on a collective scale then it's not a mutated virus it's basically the virus now which carried a certain frequency merges with the whole and becomes one with everything and it's not no longer cre creating a, a focal point uh, expression to to feed off or vampirism or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it it doesn't have to exist there and that any longer right so so in essence uh, i like this metaphor of of entities with that uh, are not having souls and and thought forms are actually uh, software programs or AI, artificial mm -hmm. uh, intelligence that we create in order to challenge us and to evolve. Correct. Correct. Good. I like that. Excellent. So I think I like we'll it. have to wrap it up there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And okay. uh, it was a, a pleasure uh, playing with you again. Thank yeah. you. I'm. I'm. I'm very. Uh, Say, hum, I don't know the term in, in English, but um, besides of being grateful, I feel like empowered. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I'm going to.